Hello and welcome to another SDA q and I'm your host today, Peter Dixon, and my very special guest is Robert Brinsmead. Good to have you with us, Bob. Can I, can I call you Bob? Yes, everybody calls me Bob, okay. except my late mother. <laughs> Hey, well, I'm, I'm so pleased that you took the time to have a conversation with me today. You're heading off to the Philippines, I think, tomorrow or the next day. Yes. Uh, and uh, Fly out. Uh, leave here on Tuesday, fly out on Wednesday morning early. Right. Tuesday. Right. Well, we really appreciate it. And I, I know we're going to be chatting today about the... Um, you know, the historic Jesus. And when in our last interview, well, I think we've had two of the longest between you and uh, Matthew Corpman, we've had the longest interviews on SDA Q&A ever. And we chatted towards the end of the last one. Uh, and you were talking about the historical Jesus and a lot of information that's sort of come to light. And I found it fascinating. I said, let's get you back. And so I guess here we are. And uh, but I also wanted to chat a little bit about um, you know, the, the church is often intrigued and interested in that time period that you were very much uh, active with your thoughts on the investigative judgment and the sanctuary in 1844. And your book, 1844 Reexamined, was a, it was a classic within the, the uh, annals of Adventism. And so just before we start and we talk about the historic Jesus, I wondered if we could just briefly chat about some of your thoughts around that time period, you know, the Glacier View, pre-Glacier View, after Glacier View, the work that you were doing, traveling around the country there in America, you, you were bumping into people like academics and scholars who were clearly not convinced that uh, the investigative judgment could, could uh, hold water uh, when, you know, from the Bible alone. And I think you might've had a few conversations with some of them. Can you tell us about your thoughts as they shared with you that maybe they didn't really believe the investigative judgment as the Adventists taught and how they were perhaps unwilling to to share the reasons for that with the general church body and how that kind of made you feel at the time? Well, the, uh, the first surprise I got was probably in the late, if I, it would have been in the late 60s about probably about 1969, I was in Washington, D.C. And I had the privilege of meeting and having a dialogue with uh, um, Don Neufeld, who was one of the leading scholars in the General Conference at that time. I remarked to him that I th observed that very few Adventists would be able to prove from the Bible alone that such a thing as the investigative judgment began in 1844. At that time, I believed in it. And I thought I had some way of proving it from scripture by a very long and difficult process. And when I made this remark to Don Neufeld, he bluntly said to me, why, he said, I can't prove it from the Bible. And I said to him, don't you believe in it? He said, Yes, I do. But I said, we're supposed to establish our faith in the Bible and the Bible alone. If you can't prove it from the Bible, why do you believe in it? And he was very blunt about it, very frank. He said, I believe it because Alan White teaches it. He said, that is the only reason, the only basis I have for believing it. And then I found by further conversation with him and also by other information that his colleague, Raymond Cottrell, came to the same conclusions. Raymond Cottrell knew the original languages. Um, he could read the Hebrew, he could read the context of Daniel 8.14 and he, 
And it was his position, if you just take a straightforward reading of Daniel 8.14, the uh, cleansing or whatever you're going to call it, the, the restoration of the sanctuary to its rightful state, had nothing to do with the cleansing of the sanctuary from the sins of God's people in the investigative judgment. But the context was that the little horn had defiled the sanctuary, had trodden it down, taken away the daily sacrifice and so on. And that the restoration, cleansing, justification, whatever you call it, of the sanctuary was from the defilement that had been caused by the little horn. That was Cottrell's position, uh, analysing Daniel 8.14. Well, it was a surprise to me and it, it was... It was a sort of thing that was in the back of my mind. At that time, I believed that such an event began in 1844. Um, then, uh, as the years went by, and I had uh, passed beyond the teaching of any final generation perfectionism, I had come to the uh, a better understanding of what the Reformation was all about and the, uh, the theology of the Reformers on justification by faith and so on. And as I dealt with that, thought it through, not just its uh, forensic meaning, but its eschatological meaning, I came to the conclusion that the only pre-advent judgment uh, could be through the through the... New Testament gospel and one's response to that. Uh, either one would be justified under life eternal by his response to the gospel, or as John 3 said, he would be condemned. Um, so I, be, I then began to call into question the need for and uh, this, this great Adventist appendage called the investigative judgment. What was the purpose of it? Now, in my last uh, visit to America, I there were two people I visited, it's significant. Uh, one was Dr. Heppenstall. He was now retired and living at Monterey in California. And um, I spent an evening with him and he raised the question of the investigative judgment and indicated to me that he didn't like the term investigative judgment. He had difficulty uh, appreciating its significance, its role, and he inquired of me, did I, could I fill him in and explain to him historically how the doctrine began? So I took him back to 1844 to the shut door of Advent, the seven years of the shut door extremism of the early Adventists of Ellen White, James White. She wasn't Ellen White to start with. She was Ellen Harmon, who later married James White. But however, they passed through those seven years trying to work out what had happened in 1844 until in the year 1957, that's 13 years after the Great Disappointment, James White, for the first time, had a, an explanation or gave an explanation of the doctrine of the investigative judgment. That was in the year, and I, I explained this to Eppenstall, and he just shook his head at that time. He just shook his head and said, well, you know, it's, uh, he, he could not see the, he indicated to me he could see no rhyme or reason in the doctrine of the investigative judgment. Uh, then it was just a little while after I was down in Sacramento and I met up just briefly with Desmond Ford and raised the problem of the investigative judgment with him. He indicated that he was, he thought in a, in a, his, his, his view of the matter was very, was basically the same as mine that the only pre-advent judgment could be through the preaching of the gospel and one's response to the gospel. 
that decided whether one was justified, as the book of John says, under life eternal, or whether one was condemned. It was all on the basis of the gospel. What was there? There's nothing in the New Testament. There's no clue in the New Testament, unless you go to some sort of way out, uh, um, obscure interpretation of some text in the book of Revelation, which... Uh, which is a bit like reading the prophecies of Nostradamus, in my view, as mm. far as some people's interpretation of it. So, but when I, going back to Heppenstall, when I was with Heppenstall, when I saw his response, his um, dissatisfaction with the doctrine of the investigative judgment, I put the proposition to him, he was a respected, leading theologian of the church, why didn't he raise the issue? Why not raise the issue? Mm. Well, he was just retired and uh, it was beyond him and he he didn't want to stir up, you know, a big fight in the church and he, he wasn't prepared to do anything about it. After that, I met Des. And I said, Des, why don't you raise this? I, I mean, I, I was not even... I. I hadn't been a member of the church for many years, so I didn't. And frankly, I felt I'd had my, I had my, uh, you know, issues and the uh, um, controversies of the old awakening. I, I hadn't had an appetite for more controversy. Frankly, I didn't want any any more controversy at all. So I raised to him, "Why don't you, why don't you raise this issue? You're a respected theologian. You're you're in a position. You can do that." And basically, Des gave me, a, at that stage, a cop-out very similar to what Heppenstall had done. He said, well, I have enough on my plate on the, on the controversy of the meaning of righteousness by faith, of its forensic meaning and its distinction from the, uh, the doctrine of sanctification. Um, Although they are united, they are not. They are also distinct, and so on. He he had a very clear understanding of that at that stage of that. So he said, uh, basically, he had enough on his plate, and he didn't want to touch it. And with that, uh, I returned to Australia, and uh, the, I don't know how long. I suppose it would might have been two or three months after that. I decided that I wasn't going to sit on this and say nothing about it. I couldn't do that. Uh, I'd wish someone else would do it. So I sat down and wrote 1844 re examine mm -hmm. And after that was published and began to circulate and have a, some sort of, I suppose, a, a, quite at that stage, a, a limit in influence. But at least... But at least um, the genie was out of the bottle. Mm, mm. And so that put Des on the spotlight because people at PUC then put the question to Des, well, Des, what about it? And that brought him to the place where he gave that significant speech at um, um, presentation at, at, uh, at, at PUC that, mm. that, that uh, opened everything up. The October 27. That's about, you know, the background of it, yes. Mm. Um, look, that's fascinating to hear that. And I, I'm so glad you wrote that book because in some ways it it um, it really got the ball rolling and um, started some debate on it. Is that, like, I, I'm, I've got a copy of that book, but they're really hard to come by um, online. Do you still have any copies there that... No, I don't. How, how the, can people... the, the only copies I have, uh, I, I've had a friend who uh, who made a uh, a collection, um, an archive, uh, pretty well of all the stuff I ever wrote. Mm. And among that, he's got all the all those old papers, all those old books. Okay. So I'm, and that's online somewhere. There is it. Well, I have I have the archive, but 
I intend putting up a website where I offer to, um, I'll share a copy. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to the Philippines and yeah. I have over there a website operator whom I, I use. And we, we're going to put material online whereby people can write in if they want any of those old copies. Oh, that'd be I'm not quite there yet. Yeah. Oh, look, that'd be fantastic. Um, someone's just written, uh, I'll just bring up a question. Uh, where is it? Um, someone's just written in the early eighties, I was listening, I think it's, uh, George, George, um, you have to tell me how to pronounce your last name properly there, George. Um, in the early 80s, I was listening to Bob's cassette tapes and reading Verdict. I was living in Brazil and translated some of his articles and distributed copies. Copies. Can you tell us a little bit about um, your present Truth and Verdict uh, magazines and how did they, were you influenced by your 1844 re-examined writing? Did that lead into to the, the magazines? Uh... No, the the um, uh, the 1844 re-examined. I followed that up with Judged by the Gospel, a review of Adventism, and then the third one I did was Sabbatarianism re-examined. That tended to bring to an end my era with the verdict publication. The <coughs> Um, Can you just tell us the timeline there? So you um, re-examined, 1844 re-examined came out in about 79, was it? Yeah, 79, 80, somewhere and, there. And when did Present Truth and Verdict begin? Oh, it ended about, we kept it going for a few more years, maybe uh, 85, right. 86, and then we tailed off for of the a few other papers called Quest and Destiny and, and uh, then I returned to Australia and, and that was the end of my, uh, I was, it wasn't the, <laughs> it wasn't the end by any means of my theological journey. No, no, no. But. Um, <clears throat> it was like an end of a, a phase, like a Picasso colour period had ended. Well, I, I, I'd crossed the uh, I'd crossed the the Adventist Rubicon when I did Judge by the Gospel and followed it up with uh, Sabbatarianism re-examined. That was like the uh, along with the trio 1844 re-examined. Um, when I wrote 1844 re-examined, I did not write it with the aim of repudiating Adventism. What I proposed in 1844 re-examined, since I had come to a new appreciation of the all sufficiency of what I regarded as the Pauline Reformation gospel, with its centrality and justification by faith. The bottom line of 1844 re-examined was to propose a reinterpretation of what Daniel 814 would mean. Then shall the sanctuary be restored to its rightful state or justified. I, I rather like the one uh, under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be restored to its rightful state. Now, I, I agreed with Desmond Ford that uh, prophecies can have several applications, which uh, you can apply to this stage, it can be applied to this history, it can be applied as he did it, and agreed it could be applied to Adventist history. Well, what I proposed in 1844 re-examined uh, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, or then shall the sanctuary be restored to its rightful state, or to be understood in a simple one-liner, 
then shall the gospel be restored to its rightful state. Now, if Adventism had taken its cue from that, I believe that there would be some future for Adventism. Mm. If they believed that their mission was to restore the gospel to its rightful state, that could be the only significance that you could ever read into the uh, the reason de etre of Adventism. Mm. But then, um, as I as I went on further to look at the the background of Daniel eight and nine, the date setting, uh, the fallacious arguments to come up with the dates 1844, which was originated by William Miller. Uh, 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 they had no, they had no real support. So then, then I moved on. Uh, and then you might say that with the trio of then those publications, uh, I crossed my, I crossed my Adventist Rubicon. Mm. It, it, it was it was done and dusted as far as I was con as concerned. So, but so come early eighties, eighty like eighty four, eighty five, you were kind of done and dusted. Uh, with Adventism, yes, yeah. Adventism yeah. was done and dusted. Yeah, um, it was done and dusted so thoroughly that I I really didn't want to write anything more about it. Mm. Uh, and I think if uh, most people have read. Uh, judged by the gospel. I didn't write it in, a, I wrote it in a very ironic spirit. It wasn't, uh, I wasn't, it wasn't written in, uh, I didn't write something like uh, uh, um, Ray wrote The White Lie, mm. in which uh, uh, there was a sort of a bitter, I, you know, a bitter, angry, uh, sarcastic spirit about the whole presentation. Mm. In mm. my view, that was my, my reality. And I didn't want to go down that road. Mm. I, I had some critical things. I had a critique. I, I dealt kindly with uh, with Ellen White. I pointed out the problems of Ellen White, but I treated her like my spiritual mother that I wanted to respect. Mm. And so my... I, my uh, ad, uh, Judged by the Gospel, a review of Adventism was written in a very Irenic spirit, not in a, not in a, not being disappointed, not being, not being nasty, not being critical, not being judgmental, but just plainly looking at the facts that, that there were certain mm. things there that can, cannot be supported. It cannot be supported by any uh, claim that this is, is biblical. Mm. Mm. I, um, I was a teenager in the early 80s when the, all this was going down here, here at Avondale. So I was close to where a lot of the conversations were happening. But it wasn't until the, maybe 89, 90 that I came across um, 1844, 1844 re-examined. A friend gave it to me. Thank you, Graham, if you're watching. And um, earlier I had been reading Walter Ray book around 86, something like that. And I couldn't finish reading it. It was so <laughs> hard to read. Uh, and then I started reading Ron Numbers book, Prophetess of Health. And that was easier to read, but I, I did, I'm just conf concurring yes, with what you're saying. Yes. When I read 1844 Reexamined, it felt like just, oh good, we're just looking at this as something to be discussed. It, it didn't have any vitriol in it. No, um, no, it didn't. Well, it didn't shake me at all. It was just look. Let's look at this from a um, calm point of view. Well, I, I tried never to. Uh, if you go back over my writings, uh, I, I might have offended. Uh, it wasn't uh, maybe in my whole career once or twice, but it would be a, a mark. I, I didn't. I never dealt in the currency. It was my uh, stance to deal in the currency of any ad hominem arguments. Mm. I mean, yeah. in the days when, you know, Des and I had some rip roaring arguments, right. one against the other, but yeah. we, we always were friends. Yes. We, we treated each other courteously. 
Yeah. Or, although if we disagreed, we 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 weren't disagreeable about it. Yeah. There was a time there where you and Des were quite polar opposites. Was it your awakening movement? Is that what we were? Yes, it was. Yeah. And then uh, can you tell us a little bit about how, by the way, my, my father, Robert Dixon, says to say hello. He was with you at... Yes, at I remember Hale. him. I remember yeah. him very kindly, yes. Yeah, in 1956. He, he, he was the assistant preceptor. That's right. At Avondale, and a very good one at that. Yeah. Um, and uh, my mother used to go along to your Sabbath morning or Sabbath school programs or afternoon. Uh, that was when you're, you were more along the awakening kind of more historic Adventist kind of um topic and um so yeah they remember you very well and very fondly um so can you tell us a little bit about the transition then when you went from the more conservative perfectionistic view what what triggered you to to want to to shift to something that was more in alignment with like there came a point where you and you and des were more in alignment with your views and heppenstall and cottrell and these guys what was the um, catalyst that brought about that change in you? And, and did it happen pretty rapidly or did it happen over a few years? Well, I suppose there would be both elements. I, uh, I, at the end of the day, I'm always, I end up my best critic. That's been, uh, I don't know whether you want to call it an asset or my problem. <laughs> but um, the, the change to begin with, um, first of all, there was an occasion where the Pope was coming to Australia and there was some discussion whether we were in favour of the papal visit or whether we would be against it. And it, it even was discussed in some television program and um, it looked like the possibility I was going to be involved in some debate with a Catholic priest. So I thought I'd better do my homework on the issues of the Reformation. I had a general view, like, you know, I, I knew the Great Controversy well, and, and but really, if you could read the Great Controversy, you'd get no idea of what the real issue of the, what the issue was between the Reformation uh, and the, let's say, the Augsburg Confession uh, versus the Council of Trent. Um, it doesn't throw any light on what the real controversy was about. So I began doing a little bit of reading and then I I went up to the Bandio Seminary, a Catholic seminary in Brisbane. And I, I was uh, very kindly given an interview with a leading theologian, I forget, it was a doctor, somebody, uh, a priest and also a theologian up at the the Catholic institution, and he surprised me by his affirmations, very firm affirmations on salvation by grace alone. I was blown away. Uh, I found that he gave me the history of the Catholic Church and this question that the Catholic Church was not only against Pelagianism, which was almost uh, going back in history. Uh, he was one of the early heretics of the church who proposed uh, almost uh, salvation of, or justification by good works. They not only opposed all of Pelagianism, but they even opposed what is called in Hostrup historically semi Pelagianism. Um, he had a very strong affirmation of salvation by faith alone. 
and grace alone. So I realised then that maybe we, we, we hadn't clearly appreciated the uh, what the Reformation tangle was all about. So I did more work on it and uh, I was I was making some good headway and I got my brother involved and it was an interesting thing. I, I had a book. Is this John? A, a John, my brother John. Yeah, he's had a big part in my journey. We, we still journey together. Um, at, I had a book by... I got this book out of the library by a debate between Hans Kung, the Catholic theologian, and Karl Barth. And the book was called Justification. And it was edited by Hans Kung, the Catholic theologian. At the beginning of the half of his book, he gave a digest. He gave a digest of the theology, the triumph of grace, according to Karl Barth, in which Karl Barth gave a, a vision of what the doctrine of the Reformation was all about. And then he did a summary of Barth sent his summary of Bart and says, now I want to make sure that I got you right. I don't misrepresent you in anything. Bart wrote back to, Carl, to, to Hans Kung and said, Hans, you've done such a good job of my theology, I could not write it better myself. And then Kung went on to the latter half of the book to give a critique of the theology of of not only Karl Barth, but a critique of the theology of the reformers. Uh, a lot of good points were raised in that debate, which, which, which were very informative. But my brother John at the time, he had the mumps. And that's a dangerous thing to get when you're, you know, up in your 30s, heading towards 40. And he was in bed. He might have been 40 by that time. Yeah, it probably was. Anyway, he had nothing to do, but he wanted something to read. So I gave him this book to read. And when he read, he saw something in it that I had overlooked. And he said, um, he got an insight that the, the, the Pauline doctrine of righteousness by faith. He said, if you understand what Paul means by righteousness by faith. In the historical process of this life, we are righteous only by faith. You can't be righteous by empirical reality and righteous by faith at the same time. The righteousness of faith is only by faith that you are righteous. Your righteousness is, is in another your righteousness is in heaven at the right hand of God. And that's the only righteousness you can stand before God with. Now, the conclusion he reached from that is that the righteousness of faith is justification alone. The article of sanctification is inseparable from justification, but is not part of the righteousness of faith. The righteousness which is of faith, according to Paul, is by faith alone. If you're going to deal with sanctification, that's not by faith alone. That involves a lot of human effort, keeping your body under and bringing it to subjection and, and working out your own salvation with fear and trembling, you know, and so on. As Bishop Ryle well said, that there's no more pestilent error in the church than sanctification by faith alone. Sanctification is not by faith alone, mm -hmm. but the righteousness of faith is only by faith. Now, 
he made a clear separation between what God does for us and what God does in us. The first is the righteousness by faith, of faith. The second is the righteousness of sanctification. Now he says, if Bart is correct, and this is the doctrine of the Reformation, he said to me straight out, he said, Bob, it's all over for the awakening. Wow. It's all over. Well, I looked at it, I squirmed, I wriggled, I see if there was any argument that I could bring against it. All the arguments of the final generation meant nothing. He just... It was just like he brought out a big shotgun and that was it. Wow. And then I wrote an article. I wrote an article, just a, a short one, summarising what we'd found, that the righteousness of faith is justification alone. They're the same article. And... Noel Mason, who was a student of Dares at Avondale, got the article, he read it, and it just about blew him away. He said, I'd never confronted this before, and it was so enlightening to him as something new he had never been taught. He took it to Dares and he says, Dares, you have never taught me this. He says, is Bob right or is he not right? And Dares says, leave it with me. I want to think about it. I'll, I'll come back to you. And it was a couple of weeks before Des came back to Noel Mason, his student, and he says, Bob is correct. The righteousness of faith is justification alone. Now, it was only a few months after that that we met. With that article alone, it was so horrendous that it, it blew me out of the water. The old perfectionism, the awakening was dead. It was gone. Wow. You couldn't hold to the two of them. All right. I thank my brother for sharpening the point. Uh, we met up in Washington, D.C. with the General Conference Brethren, and John had a little conversation on the side with this. Can you say what year this was? Sorry to interrupt. This was about 1969. Right. He said to Des, Des, he says, you and Bob went round and round arguing about the angel of Revelation 18 and the timing of the latter rain and the death decree. You went round and round like a couple of idiots. He said, if you had understood the gospel of righteousness by faith, you could have straightened us out in five minutes and it was all over with. Wow. Uh, now, if you read the, the material that Jill Ford has been going over in the mm. Glacier View and where I come into the debate and Des, just as a sideline of the background mm. of Des and so on, you will find that Des in his conversations admitted that, that they, they were the facts. Mm. Des got on the ball and preached the gospel in a sharper way than he'd ever preached it before, at least the Pauline gospel of the righteousness of faith. I want to warn you, there is another gospel. I might amaze you when I say at this point, as much as that enlightenment meant to me, I've gone way beyond that. That I've gone way beyond that. Yeah, I I know. There is a clearer gospel. And that, that's right what I want to... Than even that, that one. That's what I want to come to and kind of make the, the main thrust of this conversation. But I appreciate all this background you've been given, been giving. Uh, lots of people are fascinated by it. And before we head into the historical Jesus, I'll just give Gillian a little plug. You mentioned her work on the way to Glacier View. She's got volume one and volume two out. I think yes, you've read volume one. Well I haven't read it all, but it, yeah. it's quite well done and... She's very frank with the history, um, very honest. The thing that amazed me with the document, I, 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 what, 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 what I shocked me most about what Jill has written, she reported at Glacier View 
Heppenstall was critical of Dares on the doctrine of the investigative judgment where, and he appeared by the comments that, that Jill has made, the, the things that went on at Glacier View. All I can say that something happened to Heppenstall from the time I talked to him and how honest he was with me in admitting he saw no rhyme or reason in the doctrine of the investigative judgment. Mm. And he got to Glacier View with all the other brethren. He flipped right around and here he was chastising Des for calling into question the doctrine of the yeah. investigative judgment. What, because what do you he think? saw the issue. If you if you go you if you if you renounce that, the, the doctrine of the investigative judgment happens to be the only distinctive feature, the doctrine, yeah. the only uh, unique teaching contribution that Adventists by Adventists can claim to make to Christian theology. Mm. So, did Heppenstall later go back to his uh, non-belief in the investigative judgment? I don't know. I don't know. Right. I, I, until I read, uh, until I read uh, uh, Jill's account of Glacier View. <laughs> Mm. I didn't realise that Heppenstall had, had gone a long way back to what he admitted to me. Yeah. He admitted to me that the doctrine of the investigative judgment was an embarrassment. He didn't know what the, the significance it ought to be. He saw no place for it in the New Testament, uh, in, the, in the whole stream of the thinking of the New Testament. Uh, what, what was it doing here? What, what, what's the significance of this doctrine? Do you think that some of them were just appearing to oppose Des because they were concerned about their standing and their income and their job security? I I, I don't know. Mm. I I would not. Uh, I mean, I, I would not impute that to. Uh, I think he certainly saw that the doctrine of the investigative judgment, if challenged and overthrown. Could be the end of Adventism, right? Yeah, and that uh, that that burden or that responsibility, that road he did not want to take. Yeah. Before we head into the the new gospel that you've been researching and discovering, and we we touched on in our last interview, can I just bring up a couple of quick questions that have come on board since the start of this conversation? Uh, the Adventist Church, because I know you haven't necessarily followed what, what's been going on in recent times, but due to the investigative judgment and the sanctuary doctrine, this last generation theology has has been burgeoning within Adventism. And uh, one question, I think it's Lance Cameron Eggy. Hey, Lance, uh, SDA Q&A wouldn't have continued if it wasn't for Lance. So thank you very much, Lance, who uh, inspired uh, my interview and organised it with um, with uh, Bill Johnson um, in the start of season two, and then Gillian got on board and it exploded into eighty six interviews, looking at uh, Glacier View and Des Ford, etc. So thank you, Lance. Uh, and he's asked, uh, I mentioned there will be an, a last generation theology conference some sometime this year to be held at Andrews where the leading last generation theology proponents will be there as well as mainstream Adventist theologians. Uh, and then he's asked, Bob, um, I'll just check it is, I've got that correct. Uh, yeah, Bob, what do you think is the strongest arguments against last generation theology? And um, he's also added there, how should we view 1888? That's quite a complex question, but is that something you could touch on? Well, I guess you're saying that if, if last generation theology is linked to investigative judgment and sanctuary, it's just not biblical. Um, and that's a pretty strong argument against it. Well, from the view of where I stand now, the whole thing is nonsense. Yeah. Because in the teaching of Jesus, uh, I understood he taught that the, he had no interest in apocalyptic. 
He had no interest in, uh, in the so-called doctrines of the end of the world. Uh, the kingdom of God was already present. It's not a matter of looking low here, low there for the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is it's within you, or as the Gospel of Thomas says, look out, it's spread out across the, it's, it's across the hills of the, and fields. Um, so the, the whole concept of the, the end of the, the last day events is associated with an apocalyptic, uh, an apocalyptic outlook, uh, that there's no future for the world, there's no future for the earth. It's in a downward, a downward spiral. Um, the old e eon has to pass away, a new eon has to break in upon history. Um, and you're dealing with uh, a, a imaginary apocalyptic events. Uh, the evangelicals have their view of the end time, the great tribulation, uh, followed by the second coming of Christ. Uh, before the great tribulation, the evangelical generally, it comes from Darbyism in England, the doctrine of the rapture. Uh, no one could live through the time of trouble and there uh, the great final tribulation is going to be so dreadful that no one could live it through such a time but so mercifully the, the, the believers, the saints are going to be raptured out of the world. But according to Adventism and James White, before the great time of trouble, we have to, there is a period where you're going to live without a mediator. And the only ones that are ever going to give through that period, they have to get the seal of God. As Alan White says in one place, it's in early writing somewhere, I forget the page now. When the decree goes forth and the stamp is impressed, their characters will remain pure and spotless for eternity then they go into the time of trouble. Now, that's not perfectionism. I've never read any perfectionism. Early Adventism was, was based on a final generation perfectionism. Mm -hmm. It's only when Ellen White, through history and events, began to unfold when she confronted the fanaticism of the, the Holy Flesh movement and other, other, other <coughs> disturbing events that she backed away. She backed away somewhat from from some of those more extreme positions. But the, whereas the, the evangelicals, which is a form of British Adventism, they propose that before the Great Tribulation, the saints will be raptured. But Adventism proposed, original apocalyptic Advent proposed, that before the great time of trouble when the saints are being called to live without a mediator in the sanctuary, no mediator between God and man, no sanctuary there to deal with human sin anymore, uh, in order to, to, to stand in that time of trouble, you have to have at least the final outpouring of the Spirit and an event called the seal of God in which you will be sealed and be able then to live in the time of trouble. See, but both yeah. of them are entirely... Uh, uh, a theology is based entirely on a lot of apocalyptic mythology. In my view. You, and, and even though you, you would say, and I would agree, that your awakening period was incorrect, as in not not able to be supported by the Bible. Um, do you think it's an accurate assessment of Adventism? Like at that time, do you think you were teaching what Adventism does oh, truly I, teach? I was, uh, my problem was that, uh, and I, I guess it was part of my upbringing, 
Uh, I believed in the original sort of historical vision of the pioneers. Uh, and there's no doubt about it, there was no one clearer than the early Alan White of early writings. And the writings of James White that the final generation would have to uh, go through an experience uh, in order to be qualified to live in the sight of God without a mediator in the time of trouble. They'd have to attain something that heretofore was never, never attained by any generation of believers. Mm. So that's called final. It wasn't a... I never believed in any here and now perfectionism. I believed that perfectionism was a, was a gift of the judgment to be bestowed. The judgment wasn't the judgment of the saints as much as the final judgment was a judgment of deliverance, a judgment of, of sealing them and, 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 and doing a final work of grace. As, 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 instead of rapturing them to heaven as a... Uh, our Protestant evangelical friends believe they'd still have to go through it on living on this earth, but they would go through it having a sealed experience. And I taught that that was a gift of the judgment. Right. Not no no here and now. I never imagined that by by like some of Paxton documents how many many uh, theologians of the church thought that. It was by a process of sanctification that you'd finally arrived at this state that you, you'd, be, you'd be living totally without sin so that you could live without a mediator. Mm. I never believed in any, mm. any here and there. It was an eschatological perfection. Oh, interesting. It was, a, it was um, uh, my friend uh, Robert Wolfgren, who um, some of you might know, he comes from Melbourne, he became a... Dr. Wolfram, he, he became a sociologist. He wrote uh, some literature on some, uh, you know, what the old awakening was about. And he summarizes one section, uh, sentence. He says, it was perfection by grace. You don't have to attain it. It's the gift of the judgment. So to us in the old awakening, the judgment wasn't something to terrify you. The judgment was something you look forward to and pray for and hope comes quickly and and because something would be done that has never been done for any generation of saints. Not a rapture to heaven, mm. but a final outpouring of the spirit and a ceiling that would qualify you to live as no other generation had ever lived before. And to a, an observer from another planet, shall we say, how would that look if that had been bestowed upon that group of people? What what would the actions and behaviours of those um, people that had received that gift, what would that look like to them, to the third party? Well, it was only a dream, wasn't it? It was only a myth. And... Um, that's not the human experience. Mm. Uh, the human experience is that um, we are all, by virtue of being human, uh, we are, there's not the greatest of humanity. are all flawed. Mm. There's not a human being who's not in some way flawed. Mm. I, it was a great thought to me that uh, Elizabeth, I think her name was Elizabeth Murdoch, the, the, uh, the mother of uh, Rudolph Murdoch. She died when she was about 103. She was a remarkable woman. She was, you know, she was cultured, she was educated. She was intellectual. She was a, had a great social life, and she had. And they said, uh, "What was uh, to you the greatest thing about life? What's your secret?" 
And she says, tolerance, mm. tolerance. And they said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, I've been very privileged in life. I've met with a lot of very important people, great people, because of my husband. She said, I became friends with great, rub shoulders with people like Winston Churchill. And when you mix with him, here he was, cigarette ash all over him. You'd never find a man that's more obviously flawed than Winston Churchill. Mm. There's no one in the human family that's not flawed. Mm. Um, and that's why forgiveness is so important. We're all flawed. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the great, the only thing that's about redemptive that, that mentions in the in the in the Lord's prayer, it's just a very brief prayer, is to forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, because we're all in the same boat. Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't we be tolerant? We need forgiveness. Everybody needs forgiveness, and you can't ask for forgiveness unless you're willing to forgive your fellow, because you're flawed as much as he is. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, where did we get on to this? Well, we were just talking a little bit about how others might perceive what someone who had had this gift yeah. that your awakening movement well, talked about, what it would have looked like to Yeah, well, I come back to say it, it, it's a myth because uh, one of the books I was reading, it wasn't only my brother that enlightened me, I was reading other books that was making me think very deeply. I was getting out of the... The, just the reading by narrow circle of, I was reading, I was reading stuff like uh, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, a great author, uh, where he made the statement, life is not fulfilled within the historical process. Mm. You, we, we never find perfection. We never find fulfillment in, in the historical process. Now, the problem is, I, I suppose you, you've got me here to, you know, I might mention something that although I accepted the Reformation and it was a big deliverance for me at the time to get me beyond the, 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 the sort of the perfectionism of Adventism. But when I accepted the... the the implications of Reformation theology. I never gave up any perfectionism right. because the very theology of the Reformation is founded on a perfectionism demanded by God of the human family. And this is Calvin's argument against Rome is that Rome does not appreciate the perfection that God demands of humans. And he gives a vision of God seated on his throne, whose perfection is so great that even the angels tremble. The heavens are not pure in his sight. And he has you there sort of trembling and saying, how can I have this righteousness that measures with the, the demands of uh, Calvin will say that God demands a perfection in every degree to every decree to every degree. That's the perfection that God demands and he doesn't accept one iota short of his stringent perfectionism. Then he's, Calvin includes a statement, for if the very stars which shine so bright at night lose their brilliance in the light of the sun. What shall we say to the rarest innocence of man if it's compared with God's purity? Now, when you come before the throne of God, says Calvin, you have to bring a perfection that is equal to his perfection because as far as God is concerned, he got the story of Adam and Eve, one strike and you're out. So the difference between the Reformation theology and the Awakening theology was this. It was simply a change of tense. I was looking for a future perfection oh, right. that was given in the judgment. 
Now I can have it by faith, by accepting the righteousness of God in Christ. And here is a man who, according to the orthodox teaching of the Christian church, he perfectly obeys the commandments of God or the law of God to every, de to every decree, to every degree. His law, human life, matches the righteousness of God. No less. And that's the only righteousness you can bring to God to accept the, perfect, the perfection that he demands. Now, the real difference between my old doctrine of the awakening and my conversion to the Reformation theology and the theology of Paul was a change of tense. Mm. I have it now by faith. Right. Okay. In my journey, I have come to call even that into question. Mm, mm. I've come to call that in that that is a misrepresentation. This God of perfectionism, this one strike and you're out, God. Mm, mm is not the God and Father of Jesus. And that's so a good... That that's a, brings that's us a good to segue something to, today, to yeah. a, a very... Because let me tell you a story to illustrate this. And this takes me a little bit. doesn't matter where we might end up in this conversation. There's a lot of people who don't realise as my brother John is very sharp on some things. He said, when Galileo took his telescope out and he saw the universe through his telescope, it wasn't only the matter of Gal Galileo uh, confirming the findings of Copernicus that the earth wasn't the center of the system, but rather the earth went round the sun, mm -hmm. right? It was more than that. John said to me, when Galilee took out his telescope, <clears throat> it was all over for Orthodox Christianity. All over. Mm. All over, Bob, he says, as much as it was all over for us when we discovered the Pauline doctrine of the righteousness of faith. It was all over. Mm. I said to him, why was it all over, John? Galileo. Well, he said, it's like this. When Galileo got his telescope out and he looked, he looked at that sun that he knew now was stationary with the earth going around the sun, even though Luther said the big fool Copernicus, if he'd only read his Bible, he would have found that the sun, the earth went around. The, the sun went round the earth. <laughs> Trying to use the Bible to overthrow Copernicus. Mm. But when Galileo took out his telescope and looked at the sun, he found something else that was more disturbing to the Pope, to the Catholic Church, and even the Reformers, than finding that the earth was not stationary but it went round the sun. Yeah. It was something more important. He saw sunspots. Mm. <coughs> now, when he saw the sunspots, the Pope was outraged. He said, this is heresy. He said, what God creates is perfect. <laughs> there is no spots, could be no spots on the face of the sun, because the only imperfection, God is a God of perfection. He made a perfect universe and the only imperfection is on this earth and it's because of what man has done. It's original sin. It's man's fault. Now, alas for the Pope and for Christian theology, 
We have more powerful telescopes today than the one Galileo had. We have the Hubble telescopes, and I believe we have even better telescopes that are even surpassing the Hubble telescopes. Mm, there's a new one there now, yeah. Now, when we look out in this universe of ours, I haven't you I'd talk to you about this, but listen. It's What's good. the significance of these spots in the face of the sun and the Hubble telescope and everything else? But look, we look out in this universe. And rather being, it's just like Joseph Campbell says, we find in this universe, there's nothing out there that's not down here. And there's nothing down here that's not up there. And there's no God out there that's not down here. Now, when we see the explosion of a supernova or whole systems being swallowed up in a black hole and mighty collisions and fire, it's almost as if to say this little blue planet, thank you very much, it seems to be the best, the safest place to be. This is a scary universe. Now, the universe is not finished, that's a good thing. We know now it's still expanding, it's not finished. I suggest that we need to not just concentrate and think on the old fashioned God of perfection of John Kelvin sitting up there demanding a perfection that equals his righteousness and won't accept anything else. But I want to almost suggest something that to a lot of people might seem blasphemous, but God must love to have a place for imperfection because he's made a damn lot of it. <laughs> this universe, when we see the dissolution of a great nova, a supernova, which is a star, we're looking back. We're not just looking back when we see a supernova dying. Because everything created dies in this universe. The great stars all have a lifetime. They have a use by date and they'll all die. There's nothing created that doesn't. And if there's no death, there's no life. Mm. Because it was through the death of a, of a supernova that the material was made to create this earth. Because carbon was made mm. in the fires of a supernova. Our sun is not big enough and hot enough to make carbon. Now, today we live when the whole world is making war on carbon, aren't they? It's time for us to stop and think that carbon is the basis of every cell of every living thing, whether it's plant or animal, and without a supernova, there would be no carbon as the basis of life. We're all made of carbon, every trillion cells mm -hmm. of the human body, of every plant, of every animal, is all made of carbon, and carbon life is a life of dancing carbon. Mm. Mind-blowing. So, uh, yeah. Now... There's not a human being that's not flawed. We're as flawed as this universe is. Now, could God have a place in his wisdom and his scheme in something that's flawed? Will God accept anything that's flawed? I not only say God will accept anything that's flawed, he's made a lot of things He's made a created a universe in which there are yet still many flaws because old-fashioned Adventism says 6,000 years ago, you know, this happened and that happened 6,000 years ago. What childish nonsense. We see a supernova exploding by which formed the material and made the carbon by which life could exist on this planet. That took place at least four. We are looking at a telescope of something that happened 4.5 billion years ago. Mm, mm. We can see it because time and space are only two, two sides of one reality. 
Now, this is an opportunity to have a new view of God. There's not a human being among us, never has been, and never will be in this present historical that we know about. That is not some way flawed, just as this universe is flawed. We're all made in the image of God. Yes, brilliant in potential, flawed, because we do have on the same a genetic inheritance from the whole animal kingdom as well, with the tendencies of the animal kingdom and the spirit of God and planting the image of God and lightening everyone, every, everyone coming into the world. Now, If you take the old line, the old myth, there was a golden age once in which everything was perfect and all. Then man fell. And then after that, everything is in a downward spiral now until the end comes. Even science and history explodes all of that. Uh, millions of years before human beings were on this earth, life and death was taking place on this planet for millions of years before we got here. But if you take the old system of thinking, the perfect universe, then the fall, and the old view of the plan of redemption, all based on the perfectionism of God, The emphasis is on human sin and guilt and shame. And tragically, too many religious people are focused on sin and shame and guilt. As if they're the main things that God is interested in and he spends all his energies dealing with. And no better than the old Jew. The Jew, you know, had a had a there was a there was a view of the Jews that God spent three hours every day studying the Torah. <laughs> you know. Now, maybe God is interested wants us to focus on something else, the human potential and human development. Not to blame us for the fact that, you know, we're we're flawed. We make mistakes, and we need to we need forgiveness. We need to forgive others because they're they're in the same boat too. Maybe this is the arena God wants us to learn something: the importance of tolerance and patience, and the need of forgiveness, and the necessity of forgiving others. There's an arena where the great lessons of the most important thing in human development is the development of love, which is eternal. That's the thing that it's all about. So, you know, I've, I've gone on a journey that's taken me to other ways of looking at uh, and... I think if we go back to the historical Jesus. Mm. Can I just segue into that with this picture that you sent me of um, some of these books that you've been looking at? I'll just bring that up onto the screen um, because I think that is visible on the screen. We'll just no, that's, only, that's only a, just a few of them. That's just a, that's just a uh, scratching the surface, isn't it? Um, yeah. It's so, just a... uh, I just wanted to bring that up. These, those, those these are some with, of the um, these are some of the great volumes that have been written in some most of these in very recent years. Mm. And um, I wanted I wanted to now tap into that that journey, um, 
where you were looking at a historic Jesus and we touched on it in the last interview and how some of these books and others have led you into some new insights into the historic Jesus as well. Uh, and just one last quick question before we delve into that. Um, someone asked a little bit earlier, uh, so it, we'll leave the, the 1844 topic, but someone said, do you, does question for Bob, do you think that the church will ever cease and desist um, about the 1844 IJ heresy? Or do you think that's just going to, it's just a part of the DNA of the Adventist movement and it cannot be separated? Because uh, in many ways, people like yourself and Des well, and your brother were trying it, to, it, to it, it, a it, more it, accurate it, view. It, it reminds me of what Mark Twain says, it's easier to fool people than to convince them that they've been fooled. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, um, and the capacity for us as humans to believe myths and lots of things, um, I can't remember the person who said it. You could look it up on the internet, but a great statement I often think about. Um, there's nothing more certainly believed than that which is not known. Mm. Mm. That's, yeah, that's very good. So, yeah. Um, so perhaps but, just, just share with us how you began this journey of a new Jesus that you kind of saw that had been overlooked. And I remember you saying at one point in our last interview that the, the, the James took over the, the little movement um, that was kind of keeping alive the true teachings of Jesus and they eventually kind of um, petered out a couple of hundred years after in the desert somewhere. I think there was something you said about a doc, uh, some work that was discovered by a small group that had written down some, some teachings a thousand years later it was discovered. Can you share with us a little bit about that journey? of the many journeys that you've um, been on and are continuing to be on. And I love what you were saying about the carbon and, and the flawed universe. Next time you'll get me and talking about global warming and carbon <laughs> dioxide. Come oh, come right. What a beautiful subject, you know, I, I'm, 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 but uh, don't get me lost in that one. Oh, that one. Well, well when you come uh, back from the Philippines, <laughs> when you come back from the Philippines, so the, so this, uh, you know, some time back, you would yeah. when, like when we had our last interview. You sounded like you were just kind of exploring it. Some of these yeah. books by you know Robert Eisen well, and uh, James D. Tabor. Tabor, how do you say Tabor that? Is Tabor is one. Tabor. There's been a number of uh, really. They only began in about the. This began as late as the 1990s, and in the last 20 odd years. Let me tell you something interesting that happened historically just a few years ago. Uh, it was now about 20 years ago that a, a, an old bone box, which is called an ossuary, uh, turned up in a collector's warehouse in, in Jerusalem. Now, it was easy to ascertain that the bone box or the ossuary um, it's spelled O double S U A R Y, I believe. Ossuary. Um, this old bone box was easily identified as a first century or time of Jesus bone box. They could easily identify it because that's the sort of bone boxes they made at that time. And um, turned up at, in Jerusalem. And, um, on the bone box was an inscription. It was written in Aramaic, which was the language of Jesus. And if I may translate it, it says Jacob or James. That's the same word. Uh, Jacob translated in the Greek becomes James. Uh, James, son of Joseph, brother of of Jesus. Now that was caused the sensation. It it 
was a sensation among the scholars because it was. Can you hear me still? Yes. It, yes. it was a sensation uh, because it was said at the time. This is the only historic. It, this is the only extant evidence that we really have if this bone box is genuine of the existence of the historical Jesus. In other words, they admitted there was no extant historical evidence for the existence of Jesus other than this bone box. Mm. <laughs> now, a lot of people, there thinks there's a lot of extant, surely you've got a lot of extant. Extant means evidence from that period. You know, once upon a time, we thought the Bible was written by eyewitnesses. But all the scholars will tell you now, and there's no disagreement really among them, that there were no, in the New Testament, there's not one eyewitness to the historical Jesus. None. It was all written, most of it, three, three generations later. Um, but this bone box turned up and it was paraded around the world as an amazing archaeological find. Except there was, there was something embarrassing about this bone box, where it might have come from, and I can't go into that story, because they didn't want to go into that. Um, then they, they charged the collector with forgery. He, he added, it, the bone box originally said, they claimed, the bone box says, James, son of Joseph, but someone had added brother of Jesus, and he did that to get to make his bone box worth more money. Mm. There was a big court case in Jerusalem, and they brought they brought uh, all sorts of experts in on the bone box, and the leading experts showed no. They examined the patina, that is the sort of the the mould or the paste around the, the lettering of the words, and they showed that that was the same age as the rest of the writing. And it was very same as similar terms of the same age, just in that same vicinity, in a certain vicinity around Jerusalem that they'd found. And uh, so the man was acquitted, which mm. rather justified the bone box. It, it, it could well be James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. The, the reaction of many Christians was quite astonishing. A lot says, wow, that's amazing. I didn't even know that Jesus had a brother. <laughs> uh, those that read the, the New Testament carefully would have known that he had brothers. Well, they ruled that off and said, well, they were so-called brothers. Mm. No, no. It, where they mention brothers of Jesus in the New Testament, it, does, it, it, it doesn't call them so-called brothers. It just said his brothers. Mm, mm. brothers. Did Jesus have brothers? Uh, it reminds me of my brother John had a he had he had one of these books of the library. James, the brother of Jesus, he had it beside his desk or beside his bed, and he had some he had some workmen doing some tradesman doing some work in his apartment, in his home. And he saw John's book there. He said, oh, James, brother, I didn't know Jesus had a brother. John said, well, he happened to have three brothers and at least two sisters. Oh, that's news to him. So um, that was a general response to it. But it's, it's more serious than that. This James was elected by all the apostles unanimously to be what, it wasn't a term used in those days, but to be what amounted to the bishop of the first church ever in existence, the Jerusalem church, which was basically, as one of the boots shows, it was you could also call it a Jewish synagogue. He was the, he 
was the leader or the ruler of that church, James, was the first bishop of the first church, elected by all the apostles unanimously to be such. And he continued in that leadership for 32 whole years. That's more than a generation. Mm. Now, the church historian, the, the, the scholars who are dealing this, with this phenomenon now, this, this is all now coming to light. They are calling this period the real dark age of the church. Well, why call it the dark age of the church? Because we've never known anything about this before. Who knew that there was, wasn't Peter, it wasn't Paul, it wasn't John, who was the leader of the church, who, who later was called not only bishop but pope. It was James, Jesus' own brother. Mm. Now, why didn't we know about this? As we've dealt with the history, the reason is that there's been a rewrite of that history of 40 years. It was buried. And if you look at the best scholars that have dealt with the period, it was not only, it wasn't that the matter was buried accidentally. No. It was done quite deliberately. Mm. It was buried. Now, James was not only the towering figure of the first generation of what we later was later called Christian church. In those days, the word Christian, to begin with, hadn't even been invented. They were called Nazarenes. The first church or synagogue, it was the same thing. The, the word church and the word synagogue comes from the word ecclesia, which means congregation or assembly. Anybody in those days, any 10 Jews could begin a new synagogue. And there were many synagogues around Jerusalem, all different kinds. There was Essene synagogues, there was Pharisaic synagogues, there was racial synagogues of various kinds. And so there was an assembly of uh, the followers of Jesus. In this first church organised in Jerusalem, they were all Jews. It contained the family of Jesus, his mother, his brothers, probably his sisters. The uh, Book of Acts doesn't mention sisters, but, but we assume that the whole family was there, the family of Jesus. All the apostles had been with Jesus for his, during the period of his ministry. They were there except Judas. Um, at least a hundred. There's an exact figure of 120 is given in the book of Acts, whether that's literally true or playing with numbers, I don't know. Uh, within a short time, it, it comprised thousands of members. Wow. By the time of the 50s, the end of the 50s, nearing uh, you'd have about maybe the year 60, 61, somewhere in there, in Paul's last visit to Jerusalem, he goes up to Jerusalem and he, may, and he meets James. Now, Luke, the author, the so-called author of Acts, doesn't even tell you that he was the brother, this man was the brother of Jesus. Well, we know that by carefully reading the New Testament. It's clear enough from Paul that Jesus had a brother and he was the leader of the Jerusalem group. Um, James said to Paul, Paul came with offerings from all the Gentile churches to bring to the poor at Jerusalem and so on. And James said to him, now Paul, uh, see here, you read this in Acts 21. There's thousands of believers here. They're all zealous for the law. <laughs> this was his point. Now we'll leave that debate to another time. But there were thousands. He had thousands of believers. Compared with uh, the Church of Jerusalem up to that up to that point of history, Paul's movement was was very small, uh, comparatively insignificant, you might say. Um, and as um, 
uh, Scopes, a very good scholar of that period, pointed out that the early Christian movement at this time was was so tended to be quite factious. Paul's Paul's ministry and the work he was doing was was only one stream among many streams uh, in the church that were that were developing in the church. James from the Church of Jerusalem was sending out testimonies, directions, governance. He was the towering figure of the entire movement. The Jerusalem church was the mother church. Mm-hmm. And when James sent out his emissaries or his letters out, even men like such as Peter and Barnabas trembled. That's clear from what Paul says in Galatians 2. He was there eating and fellowshipping with them and at the same table with the Gentiles and the emissaries of James turned up. Peter was so 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 afraid or so unnerved, he got out of there, he and Barnabas, as Paul said, the several. I, I just only mentioned that, the authority of James. Peter, you read in Acts 12, I think it's about verse 7, it was his habit of reporting to James. He was the towering figure of the mother church that had influence out there in all the churches. Now, one of his early disputes rose with Paul because the only way they could keep this movement together, it seems to the mother church at Jerusalem, it was the big church. And there was little house churches springing up. I want you to get the picture. Little house churches springing up around Palestine Churches abroad were starting to, Paul was one of only, you know, one ministry there. There was many others going on. It was the custom from the headquarters, Jerusalem, like the General Conference, as Adventists would say, that it would be a good thing that, that that anybody preaching the gospel out there doing a work would have a testimonium from James saying they were authentic, they weren't crackpots, you know, mm, because right. they were getting a lot of... The, the, the movement was tender, always Christianity was very factious movement at that stage. There was everything being piped starting to be... And people having visions, people having revelations of the the risen Jesus and claiming to be prophets, wandering from church to church or, you know. So the decision was made to send out that they should have testimonials from James. Now, that's what Paul is quarrelling about in 2 Corinthians 3. He refused to submit to the need for any Mm -hmm. approval from the Jerusalem church because he said, I've been called of God as an apostle and my calling is not of men. When I got this calling from God, I didn't confer with anybody. I didn't confer with headquarters. I didn't confer with Peter, James or John. I got my commission directly from the risen Christ. Mm. And there's not one iota of proof that he ever submitted anything to the mm. leading church to get his directions or testimonials from them. So Second Corinthians 3, he refused to, he gives an, uh, an argument about why he, and so on. So anyway, uh, this is the church uh, for 32 years, which uh, James ruled with a tremendous amount of authority. And Paul was like, compared with James, he was only a little guy out there. Mm. And he was only one stream among many that James had to deal with. Now, the movement of James in Jerusalem, thousands, 
that, I mean, the day of Pentecost came and they, after that they, they baptised in one sermon that says so many thousands and the next day so many more thousands and after 32 years, James had a big, a big program going. Mm. Now, it was so big that when the high priest, who was related to Caiaphas, the high priest that had Jesus sentenced to death, it was the next generation. He was the same priestly family. When Jesus was put to death, the high priest wanted him to put to death, of course. They wanted him out of the way. But they, had, they couldn't do it without Rome's permission. But when it came to James in 62 AD, or of the common era, in the year 62, the high priest never got any permission from Roman authorities. Illegally and surreptitiously, he had James murdered. Mm. The whole Jerusalem community was so shocked and appalled. Not just the believers, but the Jews in general that it was generally believed, and Josephus bears this witness, and we have a number of witnesses, that they were so shocked and appalled with what they did to James. He was so highly esteemed, not only in the believing com his own believing community or synagogue or church, whatever you want to call it, but his reputation in the entire Jerusalem community or Judea was so large so well respected that it was commonly believed that the destruction of Jerusalem that's, that followed not long after was a result, not what they did to Jesus, but what they did to James. Mm -hmm. Even Josephus bears witness to it. Mm -hmm. And you can realise if they had a vote in Jerusalem, if they had a vote in Jerusalem in those days, if it was democratic, to the who would be the mayor of Jerusalem, by all the information we have, James would have won it hands down. Wow. That's how it's, what a powerful figure he was. Mm. Now, There's some other interesting things. That, that leads us to the conclusion that this, this church at Jerusalem that James was leading, they were all Jews. They kept the Torah. They lived the Jewish way of life. That's clear. They circumcised their children. They kept Sabbath. More than that, they went beyond that. They were Nazarites. If you look at the evidence, most of them uh, neither drank wine nor ate meat. Yeah, you know, the Adventists ought to love that one, eh? Hey? The original church, but that's not the end of the story. It's, it gets quite embarrassing as you push it on further. James aspired, it was clear that what they were after, they wanted to take over. We would use the term today, take over. I'm, I'm using it in, a, in an exaggerated sense. He aspired that what his message of carrying on the work of Jesus was to, ta was to um, be the dominant force of Judaism. They had no intention of ever, to leave, of ever leaving. This is one thing we have to get clear. James and his party had no intention of leaving Judaism. No. Their intention was to dominate, control, take over Judaism. They were to be the future of Judaism. So they had no intention of leaving. Now, if I may skip a bit of history and try to explain what happened <coughs> a generation later, 20 years down the track, after 70 AD, about then, about 20 years after 70 AD, the rabbinic party got the, got control of Judaism. 
and they threw the Nazarenes out. They expelled them right. from the synagogue. So they had no intention of leaving Judaism. They were thrown out of Judaism in the end. But that took time and some events that came in between that made that possible to happen. Now, this is a powerful movement, threatening to take over Judaism, having the popular support of Jerusalem to a very large extent, to be a towering figure for all the other churches that were springing up in Palestine and abroad. That was the apostolic church because the family of Jesus were in it. James was its leader. And its members were all the apostles. It's the only church qualified to be the apostolic church. Now, I grew up in a church that aspired to return the church, to have a church that would revive the faith and the purity of the apostolic church. That was the ambition of Adventism. It's often mentioned. You read it in Adventist literature. That's what they're all about. To re, to re, to, and you read it in Alan White, the vision of re, reviving or restoring the faith and purity of the apostolic, the first church, the, the original, where it started and purity, you know, like the Garden of Eden, you know, the whole story, you know, you go back. It was once upon a time when nothing was wrong. We had the perfect church. And it was the apostolic church. Then there was not only Adventism, it was the Campbellite movement that became the, you know, the churches of Christ. They made the big thing of the mission, the vision of the Campbellite movement was all based on restoring the church to the faith and purity of the apostolic church. The problem is neither the Adventists nor the Campbellites had a clue what the apostolic church really was and what it stood for and what it really believed. Now, uh, what did they really believe? Well, the point is this, it's not even any, it's not a matter any longer of any conjecture what they believe. I mean, here's, you know, I got books here. The best books in Christendom, the best scholars you could find in the world today write about James and, and Jewish Christianity. They're all agreed. It doesn't make any difference whether they're Catholic writers with a Catholic background, a Protestant background, a Jewish background, or just no particular denominational background at all, just plain historians of Jewish Christianity. Let me give you a number of things, Jesus, that the Apostolic Church actually, to give mm -hmm. you a, just a basic overview, a shocking. Mm -hmm. You want to return to the faith and purity? I say to Adventists, do you want to return to the, to the faith and the purity of the Apostolic Church? Mm -hmm. Are you fair dinkum about this? Mm -hmm. I say to the churches of Christ, hey, listen, you guys, do you know what the faith and purity of the, do you know what, the identity of that church was and what they really believed and what they really stood for? Well, you've got a big shock coming. They were later called Christian. Later in history, we, we've just, we've, they called in, in the whole body of literature and everybody knows this and deals with the problem of Jewish Christianity. They called Jewish Christians. It's not a good term because the word Christian is very misleading because in a sense they aren't Christians at all. Not Christian as Christian is understood. There's nothing orthodox Christian about them. There's hardly a Christian doctrine that they subscribe to. But they're still called, we call them, because in, they did believe that 
Jesus was an anointed prophet. And in the sense anointed as Messiah, and so from that you can get Christ, and yes, in the sense they were Christian in that sense. But not in the in the sense of the general understanding of who Christ is as as Christian Christology. No, they never believed in any of that. Not not any of it. Let me give you a summary of now of what this mother church, mm-hmm. the first church. You can't get anybody closer to Jesus than his own brother. Mm. And he wasn't a, a ever, they've now proved he was never an unbeliever. He was always with Jesus. He was there at the Last Supper with Jesus. Uh, according to Thomas, he appointed him to be the next leader, but at least the apostles met and they elected him as their leader. Were the family of Jesus unbelievers? Well, why on earth, when, when, when James was murdered, who then did they put in charge of the church? Well, they, then they took another brother or cousin of Jesus and, and his name was Simeon and made him the leader. Well, the family of Jesus had an awful big influence on that Jewish Christian community. All right, now let me give you a summary without going into the details. Just the birds, a frightening bird's eye picture of what this apostolic church at Jerusalem, led by James, the brother of Jesus, actually believed. First of all, they believed that Jesus was the natural born son of Joseph and Mary. And a brother of Jesus, a brother of James, in the fullest sense of the word, and as one Jewish Christian document says, James and Jesus drank of the same mother's milk. If you had come to James and said, "Did you realise your brother was a virgin born?" It'd been news to James. I can tell you that. There was no doctrine of a virgin birth until the third generation of Christianity about 85 or 90 in the, in, the, in, the, in the common era, Jewish Christians didn't believe in a virgin birth. He was just an ordinary human being. They didn't believe he was divine. They didn't believe in his pre-existence. He was human as you, you and I are human, anointed by God, at his baptism, or that's most of them that put it at his baptism, he was chosen to be. Now we tell, well, what about his terminology, son of God? Well, in Hebrew literature, Adam is called. In the Bible, Adam is called son of God. But does that mean that he was God? Does it mean he was divine? No. Israel is called son of God. Any righteous man is called son of God. Any man who's anointed by the Spirit is called son of God. We are called sons of God. Their doctrine of Christ as to his sonship is called adoptionism. He was adopted as son of God in the sense that it says in Psalms 2, God is said, God is represented as saying to David, you are my son. Today, oh, I have begotten you, which really means the day of I've adopted you, you've become my son. And he does it by the anointing of his spirit. So, natural born son of Joseph and Mary, not divine, didn't pre exist. He was baptized by John according to scriptures. He was baptized in the River Jordan like everybody else for the remission of sins. So he wasn't a sinless human being. He was a faultless one in the sense of innocence and his dedication to God was unusually and impressive like James's was, dedicated to God from his mother's womb and all the rest of it. But no, um, he... Uh, The most important thing 
in the in the apostolic church their teaching was their gospel wasn't all about the person of Christ the person of Jesus they had very little to say about the person of Jesus their gospel was the teaching of Jesus that was their emphasis so um, the I come to something else even more shocking. The Jewish Christianity never believed that Jesus died for the sins of anybody. That was Paul's teaching. That did become Orthodox Christianity in a later generation. That was taken on by the great church. Paul got that gospel not from the apostles. He never heard it from Jesus. Paul had nothing to say about the teachings of Jesus. Paul claimed that he got his gospels in ecstatic visions from heaven. Mm -hmm. He had <coughs> that's that that was that was the uh, that was troubling to the now that is to say the Jewish Christians saw no more significance that the death of Jesus as, as the, of the fact of his dying in itself had no more significance than the death of John the Baptist or the death of his brother James. Unless we join a sect that still exists over there in, the, in, the, in Iraq today. The, you know there's a group, of, I forget their names, what they're called, but there are a group of believers who believe in the, in the blood of John the Baptist and they're saved by the, the blood of John the Baptist. But Jewish Christians never believed that they're saved by the blood of John the Baptist or the blood of James or the blood of Jesus. Wow. His death was a death by misadventure, of which I'll go into in a moment to explain what it meant, why he died. Jesus did not die to go up to Jerusalem. This has come for the big point now. Jesus did not go up to Jerusalem to die as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. Entirely opposite. He was utterly and passionately against the idea of any necessity as a, for a sacrifice for sins. He was against the whole concept of animal sacrifice. Now I ask you, just consider for a moment. John the Baptist was his mentor. That's where the movement began. They were cousins. They belonged to the one family group. John the Baptist was like his elder brother in a sense. Wasn't much older than Jesus anyway. John the Baptist began a ministry offering remission of sins by water baptism. And he did it right under the noses of the Jerusalem priesthood because the River Jordan was just down the valley from Jerusalem, was back up, up on the mountain, and Jerusalem and the River Jordan was down in the valley. No need to go up to Jordan and bring an animal sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. Come down here in the Jordan and you'll have a remission of sins by water, not by blood. Now, why did John the Baptist do that? because there had been a long, long tradition beginning with the apostles, uh, beginning with the prophets of the Old Testament of very passionate uh, outburst and opposition to animal sacrifice. As you read it in Isaiah 1, is the strongest outburst against the tradition of animal sacrifices. There's a, this is a big story that the, the, all the those Levitical laws you think you think those are people who think those Levitical laws all came in and were written by Moses? No, the literature now is clear. It came in later, hundreds of years after Moses in the time of the kings of Israel, in the time of uh, particularly in the time of Hezekiah. There was always an opposition, a Jewish remnant 
who were passionately against the institution or the cult of animal sacrifices. And the Essenes, thousands of Essenes in the time of Jesus, did not believe in animal sacrifices. And that's why they were vegetarian. Because the only way you could eat meat in those days in the ancient world, whether you were pagan or Christian, you'd bring an animal and you'd sacrifice it at the approved place of sacrifice. Uh, and in the case of the Jews, you'd bring it to Jerusalem and you'd share some of that with the priest. And the priesthood got their support, they got their power, they got their influence. Uh, their, uh, everything depended on the cult of sacrifice. John the Baptist, he went further. He began a proclamation of forgiveness of sins by water baptism because he represented a protest who saw animal sacrifices as something inhuman, grotesque, brutal, barbaric, not fit for a higher human consciousness to endure. Was he the first to conceive of that? Of course he wasn't. There's a long history of it. You only have to read the history of uh, a, a great Grecian thinker by the name of Pythagoras. He was also against animal sacrifices, passionately against animal sacrifices. Now, when Jesus began his ministry, he said, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. He repeatedly said it, said it more than once, recorded in the New Testament. And he got that from the Old Testament prophet, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. And he forgave sins. He went further than John the Baptist. He repeatedly forgave sins without any ritual. No animal sacrifice in Jerusalem, not even water baptism for the vision of sins. The poor guy let down through the roof. First thing Jesus said in the sick man, you know the story? First thing there he said, you know what he said? Your sins are forgiven. That itself was enough to, like, giving him an electric shock of relief and joy, happiness and relief. So, what led to the death of Jesus? He was so much against sacrifices, animal sacrifices, he went further than John the Baptist. John the Baptist began his protest against the cult of sacrifice at the River Jordan offering water to replace blood because that was his protest against the priesthood in their institution. Jesus did something bolder than that. He went right into the lion's den, right into the temple itself. And before he did it, he made a whip. What do you think he made a whip for? Now, I've had something to do with cattle. I know why men make whips. They, they're not to drive people out, they're to drive animals out. And John too is clear enough that he drove out the animals as well as the money changers who were making money. What was his protest about? It was the same thing as the protest of Luther. Luther nailed his thesis on the door of the church against indulgences. They were dark buying and selling forgiveness of sins in the days of Luther. And Jesus was a lot more passionate against it than Luther ever thought of being. He went right into the mouth of the lion's den, as it were, of the evil itself. He would attack that institution right at its heart. Because if you study the theology of Jesus as well as the ethic of Jesus, especially where he begins in John 5, You've heard it said of old time, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That was the basis of atonement. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth means payback. It means retaliatory justice. He didn't believe in any of that. 
He believed in the free forgiveness of God through the love of God and his compassion for the human family. He proclaimed a universal forgiveness, unconditional for all. Now, Jesus died protesting the need of a sacrifice in order to any blood sacrifice to make atonement for sin. And what did the Christian church after him do? Not the Jewish Christians, not the Jewish Christians, but the Gentile Christians who went on after him and a generation later, they turned around and they made his sacrifice, he made his death the supreme sacrifice to bring about the forgiveness of sins. a complete reversal of what Jesus was on about. Now, let me go back to John. Uh, let me go back to James and the Jewish Christians. I believe I could add more scholars. I've only given you the tip of the iceberg in the document. I gave you a copy of uh, what Jewish Christians... They all agreed. I don't care whether they're Catholic, Protestant, Calathumpian. What the Jewish Christians believed... It's plain to see, and it's out in the open, no longer a skeleton in the cupboard hidden, that Jesus didn't die for the sins of the world. He didn't believe in any atonement or any payback or any, any uh, retributive justice was necessary. He died protesting the whole institution of a sacrifice for sins. It's not bought or sold. It's the free gift of God, the Father of Jesus. Now, Jewish Christianity, true Jewish Christianity never taught that Jesus was a saviour. He didn't save the world. He didn't make a sacrifice to save the world. He didn't put himself on such a pedestal as that. <laughs> so, what did he teach? He taught his father, his gracious father that he proclaimed, you're saved by his grace. You don't need a mediator. You don't need an atonement. That's the grace of God. The unconditional grace of God, the amnesty to the whole human race. That was Jewish Christianity. Now, the shock of it is this, that as far as the history of the Christian church is concerned, there's enough heresy in Jewish Christianity to burn more than a thousand heretics, to merit the burning of more than a thousand heretics. Because let me remind you that not only Catholics, but even Protestants like the good John Calvin had Michael Severtus burned at the stake. For much less than what Christianity was preaching. Pope, or was it Pope Innocent the Third? I think it was Innocent the Third. He wiped out what is estimated to be up to a million Cathars in the north of France. I can't say that they were pure Jewish Christians, but most of their, their basic background was more Jewish Christianity than Orthodox Catholic Christianity. And there were, the blood of a million people was, was, was shed over that. Mm. So, Jewish Christians believe things, the basic tenets of Jewish Christianity, 
was. What the church later persecuted, burnt to death, slaughtered, annihilated, and in most cases, who were, in their judgment, less heretical than Jewish Christianity. Uh, what more do I? What more do I need to say? Amazing. Now I, I I give you the challenge to those people, and I once shared the same vision. What What's your mission as a church? What do you What do you hope to do as a church community? Well, we we, we want to go back to the faith and purity of the apostolic church. Do you really? Mm. Do we want to go back and teach a purely human Jesus, anointed by the Spirit, an amazing man? I'd like to go. I know I got time now to go into really his teachings and what amazing teachings he was, and how he opened up the door to the he opened up to the door to the Father. He gave us a revelation of God and the grace of God, and when he taught us the Lord's Prayer, did he teach us? He gave us a Lord's Prayer. There's nothing Christian. I want to tell you, I want to remind you, there's nothing Christian in the Lord's Prayer. And that's why it's a good prayer, because you can say it in, you can say it in a congregation in which there's Muslims and Hindus and, and, and so on, because our Father. Well, Matthew says, which art in heaven. That's not in the... Luke doesn't say that. that. That which art in heaven, that's a little gloss of Matthew's, peculiar to Matthew. How Father, you know, thy kingdom come. It's not writing of a future kingdom to look forward to. The kingdom is here to enter into. We're called to, go to, to live that kingdom in the here and now. This is the life that we're offered now. Forget about an apocalyptic end of the world or anything about it. Jesus doesn't want to know a thing about any of that. Not the historical Jesus. Mm. Don't want to know that. And forgive us our sins, our faults. Now, just as we forgive others, what a, what a magnificent. Mm. Just, that's it, that's it. Does, does, he, does he give us to end the prayer and say, we say this prayer in the name of our mediator, whose righteousness we present before you, as our, or, or is his death as our atonement for sin? No, he's not even mentioned. He doesn't bring himself into the prayer that he gives us. He was a beautiful humanitarian revelation. He, we are made in the image of God and our calling is we should image God. He was the ideal man who really imaged God. Looking at that life, we know we gives us confidence that the Father forgives us, that we live by his grace of course it's by grace that every breath we breathe we we unless we lived in him in him we live we move we have our being we couldn't draw a breath unless he was nearer to us than our than our than our breath and in, in our hearts uh, and we need that today because we live today in a global village Jewish Christianity, the teaching of James, teaches us not to focus on the person of Jesus because there's many things. I, I, won't, I won't die in the trench for anything that might be true about who the person of Jesus was, how he lived or whether he did this or whether he did that. It doesn't really matter. Was he really a Nazareth, Nazarite? Um, I think the preponderance of evidence is that he was a Nazarite. Uh, the Jews, the best, I've submitted some of the best statements of great scholars respected by all the, 
all the scholars of the Christian church today that, that argue, yes, he was a Nazarite. Well, uh, was he? Um, there's certain stories about Jesus always appealed to me, you know, that he, 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 he was even accused of being a drunk and a glutton. And, well, was that Jesus? Is that really making a Jesus after the image of Paul or is that a Jesus who really looks a bit or after the image of James and so on? At the end of the day, I'm not really greatly concerned because as the Jewish Christianity really, if you go back to this, where the emphasis really teaches us, doesn't really matter. I mean, in Christianity, the gospel of Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, it's all about the person whom they call the Christ. In one word, you look at the creeds of the church, it's all about Christology. I'm not interested in Christology anymore. I don't think, I don't think there's anything in Christology worth preserving. It's not necessary. Thousands of people have been killed and slaughtered over arguments about Christology. Mm. Would Jesus be interested in any of that? No, he wouldn't care a thing about it. This is not a cut, come, Lord, Lord, I don't want this Lord, Lord. Just listen to what I'm telling you and go and do it, you know. And live like I'm, I'm telling you to, to, you know, to enter the kingdom of God and live this, what I'm telling you. Um, the... The emphasis of Jewish Christianity is on the teaching of Jesus and Christology has only become a means of burying the teaching of Jesus mm. to divide mm. the church and things to argue and kill one another over. Mm. Or I think of all the literature on over Christology, that's battles that have been fought over and people have been killed over Christology. That's what Severtus was burned at the stake for. John, mm. they brought him before the, the Geneva, the, the Geneva court, the Geneva community, and John Calvin to put to him one question: Do you believe that Jesus is the eternal Son of God? And Severus answered, "Well, I believe that Jesus was the Son of the eternal God." <laughs> Not good enough for John Calvin. For that confession, he was burned alive mm. at the stake at a green fire. Imagine mm. that. Mm. Because he mm. wouldn't subscribe to that. Is any of that now? Amazing. Uh, the, we today live in a global village. We're not, get, we're not going to get anywhere fighting, fighting with a... a, a a, the old Christology to, to, to be any help to the world with a with a with a, an exclusive Christ and telling people you're going to be damned unless you believe our Christ and believe this theology and ram mm. that stuff down their neck. Mm. We're no better than a group of people who I won't even identify who they were who had a protest in Sydney except that their garments sort of gave them away, at least their female garments gave them away of what identity they were. And they had a sign. They had the little kids lined up with a sign. And it says, our dead are in heaven. Yours are in hell. Mm. I saw it on the TV. They had it there in Sydney. Mm. Our dead are in heaven. Yours are in hell. Mm. I tell you what, with Christianity has done a lot of that sort of preaching too, and a lot of sort of teaching in the past. People are excluded from the from the grace of God and cast out. They came to Gandhi. Gandhi knew more about Jesus than, and and carried more of the spirit of Jesus in him than than, than we've given him credit for. And uh, someone asked him once, "What's what's what's the biggest?" impediment for the for the message of Jesus reaching the people of India and he answered in one word he said it's Christianity mm -hmm. what he meant was Christology mm -hmm. they don't mm -hmm. want that 
that's not mm. going to do anything for a global village. That divides people. Mm. You're either in the ark or you're out of the ark. You're either saved or you're damned and so mm. on. No, that's uh, the, the emphasis on Jewish Christianity was, was the person of Jesus wasn't where it was all at. You can go and read even the, 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 the catechism of, that was written at the, about the end of the first century. It's called the teaching of the 12 apostles or the Didache. It says very little about who Jesus was. It says a lot about his teaching mm. and why it's worth everything to, you know, to, because he shows what it means to live in the kingdom of God. It's not looking for an apocalyptic end of the world. Um, how long will this planet go on for? I don't know. The scientist says we, at least it's got a, a life of it. In it's good. Maybe we've got about six billion years to go yet. We don't know. Mm. But that's not ours. To, to, that's, that's not a concern of ours. Uh, so the apostolic church is a, is a this this revelation of who James was. Yeah. It answers a lot of questions now. For instance, when when Jesus was alive, his ministry his ministry didn't last long. It lasted no longer than twelve months, according to all the scholars. Now, John has it about three, the Gospel of John has it about three years, but the synopsis are correct. They, they only, he only had one Passover in his life. So at the longest, at the longest, his mission could have only been 12 months. So it was only a flash and he was gone. Um, the intriguing thing is that Jesus had no interest or didn't want to take his message to the Gentiles or to the Samaritans. He encountered some in his ministry and they asked favours. There was a couple of records of his granting them a favour, but he never taught them anything. He never instructed them and in what he was trying to instruct the Jews. When he sent the apostles out, even the 70 out, he said, now go not to the way of the Gentiles, nor to the Samaritans. I send you only to go for the lost sheep of Israel. Mm. That was his ministry. Um, was he chauvinistic? Was he... A Jewish exclusivist? The woman came to him, a pagan woman. And she asked him a favour and to start with. He, she didn't get a very encouraging reply. She said to her, it's not, it's not fitting for me to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. <laughs> didn't seem to be very... Very, uh, cast not your pearls before swine or give them to the dogs. Uh, what's the meaning of all this? Now, I know Matthew has in the end of the, after his resurrection, Matthew has it, Jesus gives the command, go, go into all the world and preach the gospel baptising them in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Now, come on, that Trinitarian wasn't written. That's Trinitarianism. There was no Trinitarianism in the first 100 years. That was a later edit. And as far as I can see, none of the good scholars that looked at that says, no, that, that's the church writing. That's not the words of Jesus. We know what he, when he was a ministry, it was, his ministry was such, he went only to Israel. 
not even to the Samaritans. My mission is to Israel, to the, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. If James um, hadn't been murdered and the, the, the Jerusalem church hadn't kind of eventually disbanded and lost its momentum, what do you think Christianity would, would have looked like? It's a very interesting question. Uh, I, I, am I still on the thing I keep? Yes, yep, yep. Okay, we're on. Now. James was the leader of that church, the Jerusalem church, for, for 32 years. Now, if you read the documentation I sent you, it points out that there was no record of him ever leaving Jerusalem. His mission was concentrated on the Jews. Not that he tried to stop any expansion of that, because even before Jesus came on the scene, there was a, in the first century, there was a, there's a lot of good authors on this. There was a very strong um, proselytizing movement, especially launched by the Pharisees among Gentiles. And they were called, those who responded to that proselytizing mission were called God-fearers. You remember that? Mm. They were, and sometimes they worshipped at the, they joined the Jews in worshipping at the synagogue. Um, so it's not that he tried to discourage any God-fearers out there, but James did what his brother followed the exam. The only thing I can tell you this from the evidence, he followed the example of his brother Jesus. Was he a Jewish ex exclusivist or chauvinist? <laughs> What's the answer? What was he? What was he trying to do? If he concentrated there in 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 taking over or uh, dominating or becoming the, the uh, you know, it becoming the theme of Judaism. This was the real Judaism. This was the destiny of the children of Abraham. According to James. What was his modus? What was the modus operandi? Now, this gets us to something that's quite... It's quite astounding. What was the modus operandi of Jesus and James? Because they were both the same. In this, Eastman is right, Robert Eastman, as Jesus was, as James was, so is Jesus. These two men were very much alike. You can't get anybody more like Jesus than James. He's almost the mirror image of Jesus. And he too, like his brother, concentrated on a mission to Israel, not the Gentiles. The answer actually is, is really simple and quite astonishing. If you go back to the call of Abraham, God says he called Abraham to make him, to bless Abraham and called him to be his his servant and his representative. Uh, it, it says there in Genesis several times that in you all the families or all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. It wasn't an act of favoritism that God didn't care about the Gentiles when he chose the Jews. As the old saying goes, it was odd of God to choose the Jews. Now, it wasn't an act of favoritism, but God wanted an instrument. What was the instrument for? Why did he bless Abraham and call Abraham? Because in you, I want to bless all the nations of the world. That's mentioned at least three times in the book of Genesis. Now, when you come, I wrote a couple of the, the text down 
and I'll, re I'll read them, the expressions so, so I don't forget them as this. In, in Isaiah, in the servant songs in, our, in the book of Isaiah, uh, Israel is called my servant several times. And the purpose of God in calling a servant was to, quote, to be a light to all people, a beacon to all nations. Isaiah 61, 1. Arise and shine, the light has come and, and has risen upon you. For nations, nations shall march towards your light and kings can, will come to the brightness of your rising. But the most astonishing passage is one in, and this is the, the modus operandi, I believe, of James, because he quoted the Old Testament, is a prophecy in Isaiah 2, 1, and it's, it's repeated word for word in the little, in the prophet Micah. In the last days, the Lord's house will be established on the top of the mountain and all nations will flow into it. Israel was to be a light shining that all the nations of the earth would come and the kings of the earth would come to the brightness of your rising. In the last days, the Lord's house and Mount Zion will be exalted above the hills. And all the nations will come. And Zechariah says, In that day, ten men of the nations of the world, there'll be like ten men from the nations, will take hold of the skirt of him which is a Jew. And says, I'm going to come with you because we've heard that God is with you. Now, Israel was to be a light on a hill, city, shining light. And so the whole direction, the, the Old Testament from the call of Abraham through the prophets is not the directive to Israel to go out to proselytise the nations and to teach them about the true God. Right. No, it to was be to be a promised land. It was to be a community who would live out and be what humans, humanity, was supposed to be and become a city like a light set on a hill mm. that would bring the nations to it and in the, it would happen finally. The eschatological vision was finally that all nations were going to flow into it and kings would come to the brightness of Israel's rising. Now, when Jesus begins his ministry, you read it in Matthew 5, he gives the, it's all in a, it's the teaching of Jewish Christianity. It comes from the queue, all the, um, the, these, this, it was originally the, the gospel of Jewish Christianity. Uh, he goes to, not to the elite of Israel, who were nothing but a den of thieves, and always uh, corrupted their calling. No, he'd take the poor and the hungry and he addressed them, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he said to them the astonishing thing, they listened to him. Now, what is he going to say to us? He said, you are the light of the world. He didn't say you're the light of Israel. No, he said, you are the light of the world. Hey, what's he talking? He's, he's bringing this image of the Old Testament. I could read you all this text. When Israel is exalted above the hills and light and, his, and the nations will come to Israel, they shall beat their, their, their swords and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up nation and neither shall they learn war anymore. He was the apostle of a new the kingdom of God, the kingdom of love, a kingdom of not hating your enemies and treading them underfoot and crushing them with some sort of Messiah leading out in the bloodshed. No, it was one of 
the gentleness and the wisdom and, and of a new vision of what the kingdom of God and the vision of the Father. You, he said, are the light of the world. A city set upon a hill that cannot be hid. That is the language of the Old Testament. In other words, he was calling them to be and to fulfill the vision of the Old Testament, mm -hmm. the vision of the prophets. Now, that's what James wanted. Mm. James was, and it looked like, if you read this, I got his volume. It's a thousand-page volume of uh, on James when he was leading this movement in Jerusalem. There Can were you hold it up of for royalty. Us? Huh? Can you hold uh, it up for us? Robert Eastman, James, the brother of Jesus. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, now, um, it's not a perfect book. Jay, he's a bit of a maverick in some ways, but he's, he's, his major points are... Uh, uh, it's just on the right there. I'm just showing everyone. Uh, yeah. Everyone over yeah, there. yeah, you got that, that book there, James. Um, he gives an account there of some astonishing things that were happening uh, when James was in Jerusalem. They they had royalty. It was a person that was a... I forget her background. Her name was named Helen of the royal family. She became a brought a lot of money into Jerusalem and gave a lot of support to the Jewish Christians. And it looked like, you know, they were the, and they took this the fulfillment of prophecy that were going to bring the nations and the, and the kings would come to the brightness of Israel's rising. And they had the message of Jesus and this was going to do it. I mean, they were, they were full on about this. They were very mm -hmm. excited about it. Um, that... So it wasn't the vision of Jesus wasn't to go out to the world to make at, 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 at least at that stage where he was. He saw not a mission to go out and make a lot of proselytes in the world. In fact, he, he was critical of the Pharisees that were doing that. He said, you compass land and sea to make a proselyte. And what are you going to do when you make a proselyte? You make him twofold more the child of hell than he was before. Mm. You're not going to do anything this way. In other words, Israel must put his house in order. It must be what God designs it to be. It must fulfill the prophetic mission. And if they do the right thing, this is their prophetic mission, this will happen. That was the vision. So. James tried to James tried to fulfil it. Mm. Now, were there writings um, outside of the Gospels, outside of James' kind of work in the New Testament, that survived? Was there other writings? I I seem to remember reading somewhere that there was, even though the main group kind of died out a couple of hundred years later, that there was a movement that kept it going. And I think you referred to them. And they were kind of wiped out a thousand years later. They had some writings that they'd kind of um, well. Uh, the, one of the best important. Before we get to that, my, what happened? It's a bit of a tragedy in history. It is a. It's an awful tragedy of history. Um, the. James was James was murdered. He was martyred in sixty two. Then the the war with Rome uh, built up. There was a lot of skirmishes, and finally it, it was uh, the siege of Jerusalem, and they they burned the city. It was so horrendous. It was like it was it was like the end of the world for for Judaism. It was the end of the world. Um, all the records were burnt. Um, it it James was gone. The influence of the Christian Church was at less at least its influence over the Gentile churches was broken. Uh, the Mother Church really to any. The mother church that was no longer there, no longer existed. Mm. Um, 
20 years after that, they were a much weakened body and they were expelled from Judaism, which was an awful thing to happen in those days. Because if you were expelled from Judaism, you had no protection under Roman law. Mm -hmm. uh, Jews had a lot of protection. They didn't have to worship. They didn't have to burn incense to Caesar. That was a special dispensation only to the Jews. They didn't have to join the army because of the Sabbath and so on. That was a special dispensation. That was a that was an indulgence given by the Romans to the Jews. So the Jews enjoyed a lot of protection being a Jew. But once the Jewish Christians were expelled from the synagogue, they had no protection from the 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 the, the Roman law that would could arrest them and execute them for not participating in Caesar worship and and they had no they mm. they could demand that they work on the Sabbath and they had no no protections for they the Jews had a lot of rights under Roman laws. They'd earned a lot of rights, but they lost all those rights. It was a terrible thing to happen to get expelled from Judaism. From the, uh, that's only that's only one one angle of it, but it it broke the back. The events of seventy, the first the death of James, and then the the events of seventy A.D. broke the influence of the of the Jerusalem Church. Mm -hmm. It was practically wiped out. Uh, it was very impoverished. Most of it went east, went to power, and and drifted out in that direction. Um, the Gentile church then began to grow and, and, and they, they no longer had to sort of respond to the, the emissaries of James or the letters of the testimonials of James and the authority of James was no longer a factor to deal with. Mm. And the, the, um, the teachings of Paul and the Gentile Christianity came to the fore mm. uh, and, and, and gained the ascendancy. Um, um, so uh, there, was a, there was a big change in history. By the end of the century, there was a new, before the, the, 100, the year 100 arrived, in fact, it was in the 90s that you could say that already um, there was a new mother church mm. and a new bishop. Mm. The bishop's name was Clement, the Bishop of Rome. And Rome began to assume the position now of the new mother church, but it was a Gentile church. It had something very, very different to what the Jewish church was. The Jewish church had a, a human Jesus. He wasn't divine. Mm. He was the natural born son of Joseph. Over here, the Roman church had a virgin Jesus mm. and a perpetual virgin, eventually a perpetual virgin Mary, you know. And you can go on and contrast the, this mother church, what it had, and what this mother church was entirely different. It was a whole different, uh, you know, it was a different theology. It was an entirely mm. different movement in one way. Now, the the change that took place was 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 just astonishing. L let me give you an illustration of how dramatic it was, it, because the Christian movement arose. Right, Jesus' did, uh, ministry began about thirty A.D. and he died within. A, he was crucified within a year, but say thirty. So the movement began. In, in the year 30 of their century. Let me show you, uh, let give you the example of two other movements that began in the first part of one century and, and have a look at them, what happened by the end of the century. All right. Now, you've got two movements in America began in somewhere around the 30s or 40s. Mormonism might have been a little early. I'm not, I haven't got my date. I know I got my dates, but uh, of of Adventism, right? The Adventist movement arose. First of all, the Millerite became eventually became Seventh Day Adventism. It was an American movement, right? All its leaders, 
its leading personalities, its teachers were American. Same with the Christian church. The Christian church began in the first part of their century. All the members of that church were Jewish. There wasn't a one among them who wasn't Jewish. Just the same with these two movements, Mormons and Americans. Uh, Mormons and Adventists were all Americans. Here, all Jewish. Now, If you take the Christian movement, by the end of the century, that's only 70 years, right? There's not one leader anywhere on the, in the church, one recognised leader, scholar, theologian, bishop, whatever you call it, that was a Jew in it, not a Jew in it. All the Jewish Christians were heretics cast out. Mm -hmm. Just not one there. It was all right. And not only that, the church began with its mother church in Jerusalem. By 70 years, its mother church was in beginning, was blossoming, beginning to blossom. The new mother church was Gentile in a foreign country, was in Rome, spoke another language. They've taken over the movement. Not one Jew was in it. Mm. You can't get a Jewish name of any prominence among any of the church fathers. There's not a Jew among them. Can you imagine that could happen, what had happened if the Adventists or the Mormons had started, and the Americans were the leading teachers in it and the leading, uh, you know, the administrators in the organisation by 70 years at the end of 1900, was over in Korea somewhere and had its headquarters and not one American was in it. <laughs> Here we've gone two centuries, whether it's Mormons mm -hmm. or Adventists, who are the leaders of Mormonism and who are the leaders of Adventism? It shifts the culture. It's still the, it's still the mm -hmm. American, the general conference is still mm -hmm. in America, isn't it? Mm. The leader, the, the, the it hasn't major, been that shift sometime, here. Yeah. Sometimes they vote another English-speaking person, like a like an Australian, as a general conference leader. But it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen very often, right? Mm. The, the same with Mormonism. Americans still control it. Mm. Adventists, Americans still control it. But the Christian Church, something astonishing happened that although it began as an intra-Jewish movement and its leaders were all Jews, James and the apostles and the Jesus and the Jesus family, they began this movement. It was making great headway in Jerusalem. By the end of the century, mm. there wasn't one Jew left, not mm. a Jew in it. It's all taken mean. over by Gentiles and, and, and its headquarters, its mother church was in a foreign country, spoke a foreign language and were strangers to the, to, to the Palestinian culture. In your research, have you um, come across any assertions that this was a deliberate move, um, that, that Paul may have even had intentions for that to happen? Uh, Paul had an apocalyptic vision. He saw himself as a special messenger with a, a special commission. Um, uh, it's his claim. In, in, Paul, in Paul's, Paul doesn't, Paul doesn't. Um, um, there's nothing in Paul that that he refers to the actual teaching of Jesus. Nowhere does he does he mention the teaching of Jesus. Uh, might I say, of all the differences between Jewish Christianity and the, the Gentile Christianity, whose who's most influential member was Paul by far. Um, another big difference was the supper. 
uh, Jewish Christians never participated in anything that resembled drinking the blood and uh, eating the mm. flesh and drinking the blood mm. of, the, of the of you know of the of the um, of the figure they had venerated. Uh, that was completely un-Jewish. In fact, the, their followers they they celebrated the supper. The Ebionites they celebrated the supper and the, the with uh, with bread and water because uh, uh, most of the Jewish Christians that we can find by our research apparently never drank wine. Paul, Paul mentions that in Romans 14 and in Corinthians, you know. He that's mm. weak in the faith, he, he eats only vegetables, you know. So he was writing about the Jewish Christians and where they're doing and he talks about drinking wine and eating vegetables or eating meat or not eating meat. It was all related to, to sacrifice, of course. Mm. So, uh, yeah. Am I right that the Last Supper wasn't actually mentioned in the four Gospels, that it was a Pauline text? Well, the, the, the problem is when, when we read the New Testament, uh, it's rather a clever arrangement of the book. The first book is Matthew. And it wasn't the first book written because it was written quite late. The, the, the only writings that you have before 70 AD, before the great breakup of, bust up of everything, it just changed the whole history of the world, was the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. Um, and the breaking up of the of the first of the apostolic church. Um, so, but you be, begin with Matthew, and he has the the supper, and he has the the cup and the, the you know drink this cup as my blood for the remission of sins and and so on and so on, and. An average reader then read the same thing in Corinthians and he think, oh, I know where Paul got that from. He got that from the report of the gospel. No, it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. Because Paul wrote or wrote that up in, 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 in his Corinthian correspondence, uh, the, the, sake, the supper and the drinking of the cup and the blood of Christ and the remission of sins and the... And, 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 uh, and um, the bread is, is it's either the Catholic view is, becomes the real body or the symbolic, I don't care which way you do it, the symbolic body of, the, of Christ you're eating there. Uh, <clears throat> and Paul says, what I received, I give to you. Ah, we conclude. Paul received this from Matthew. He got it from the testament because Matthew mm -hmm. was the disciple. He was there at the supper, and this is what he says. No, Matthew didn't write Matthew. Matthew wasn't written until a whole generation, at least. Mm -hmm. Matthew wasn't written a whole generation uh, to, till, uh, till after Paul had passed, or passed from the scene. Mm -hmm. So when Paul says about the supper, what I have received, I pass on to you. He didn't receive it from Matthew. He didn't receive it from James. He didn't receive it from Peter, James or John. He got it directly, as he said, what I have received, I didn't get from man. Mm, he was taken mm. up. He, he was transported to the third heavens and he, he, was ta he had visions. He claimed he got it directly from his visionary Christ. Do you think Paul his had no, Paul had no interest in the all that Paul wrote about the earthly Jesus? You could write a, write on a piece of postage stamp with a mm. piece of chalk. Yeah. The only thing he says was he was born of a woman, of the seed of David. Mm. That's about all. Do you, Do you think more. what what I was saying before? I guess I was wondering if um, in your research people would suggest that his Damascus Road vision was a false claim? In the research you've done, are people suggesting that? Well, yeah. 
it's not a bad, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, as a matter of principle, I, I wouldn't bring any ad hominem argument into it. Right, right. Because I value let me that. Illustrate, let me yeah. illustrate the, the problem of that ad ho a ho argument. Um, if you said, you take a statement of the New Testament, Jesus is reported to have said something. Mm. Well, scholarship has clearly shown that many of the things that the New Testament or different part that, that different witnesses or different statements that Jesus is reported to have said. The evidence is that is not the teaching of Jesus. That is the teaching of the later church. Right. Because they're, they're putting in the mouth of Jesus what they think is the truth. And they appeal to the teaching of Jesus and yeah. they put words into his mouth. And if it's, if it's difficult, if you say, well, that's a difficult challenge to work out what Jesus said and what is the church saying and how do you know? And then, well, in a sense, I would be bold enough to say, well, you take the authority of neither of them. Mm. Look at the statement and the truth of what is said mm. is only found in what is said. Not on the authority of who's supposed to have said mm, it. Yeah, I like that. Right? Now, the only authority you've got for the truth is of what is said is only found. Jesus himself gave, when they came to him and said, by what authority do you say this? Well, I, I like the answer that, that um, uh, who, who's that? He wrote that book, Jesus Before Christianity. Um, not me. I just can't, his name is, but he argues beautifully. He's a Catholic too, but mm. he wrote that book, how he ever got it through the Catholic and premature, I don't know. <laughs> but he argues that Jesus claimed no authority. He didn't say the Bible says, he didn't say I had a vision. He didn't say that God told me this. So this is my authority. The only truth he appealed to is is in the words he said. Mm. You just look at them and, and, and the, they are self-attesting or they're not self-attesting. So mm. with Paul's, Paul claims, Paul writes certain things and he writes some beautiful things. Um, I'm a bit like Gandhi. Um, Gandhi was a tremendous fan of Jesus. He had a tremendous adoration of Jesus. And he heard all the arguments about even he lived long enough to know that there were scholars are writing, well, Jesus never existed anyway. It's all a myth. Mm. Well, uh, McGandy's comments was, well, these words in the Sermon on the Mount are worms. There's a words I live by. And it makes no difference to me whether Jesus, if you could find that Jesus didn't exist, he said, these words still are words that are meaningful to me. I yes. still live by these words. Yes, yes, yes. So, now, with Paul, um, um, the words he writes in 1 Corinthians 13 are worth putting your life on the line for. Mm. There's nothing else to live for but that. Uh, to me, they are, they're just mightily inspired. Uh, some say, well, he's, he's only quoting a, some, some great poem from some. I don't care where he got it from, whether it came direct from Paul, whether he says he got it from a vision from heaven. I don't care where he got it from. Mm. Those Tripping words speak to me so powerfully mm. that I, those words are true. Mm. Right? Now, I think I have to examine Paul's ecstatic visionary experiences the same way I have to examine Alan White's ecstatic visionary experiences. Alan White wrote a lot of good things. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to use any ad hominem argument against Alan White, like some do, mm. for what she says. Uh, what about Muhammad? Muhammad wrote some beautiful things. I've read a lot of Muhammad. Uh, Well, he, he, he got his commission as a prophet 
according to the story, he got it from his visions in a cave up there in Mount Hera or wherever it was. Uh, uh, do I reject what he says on the basis of that I don't trust his visions? You know, that he was having an hallucination? Um, oh, I've read some interesting books on, on near-death experiences people have had. Um, I've read some beautiful things that some of those writers have said on the new near death experiences. I don't accept them because they had a new death, because it came from a near death experience. The truth of, of what is said is, is found in what is said. Mm. So, mm. Um, the, the, this is the argument of Christianity. I mean, the argument of Jew, the Jewish Christians against Paul, by the way, is this, that what James and the apostles were teaching, the Jerusalem church was teaching, wasn't dependent on some vision that anybody had. They had been with Jesus. They had listened to him. They had heard his teachings. They meant something. These teachings had meant something to him. And they had accepted that as worth living and dying for. Mm. Um, so then they argued the problem with this to the Jewish Christian that the doctrine of Paul was based upon his personal visionary experiences and he this is by his own testimony he never got it from any man he got it from his ecstatic visionary experience that was his source they said that their revelation being with the personal witness to hear jesus was a more sure testimony to go by than the visionary experience of Paul. So, but at the end of the day, uh, I, I wouldn't want to say that I, I rejected uh, what anything Paul says because it came from a visionary experience any more than I want to say I reject anything Muhammad says because he, he got it from a visionary experience or anything more than a person that has a near-death experience and they have, a, they have some testimony to give. Well, I'll listen to the testimony and mm. I'll judge the message by what's in the message itself. Mm. 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 And I think if you look back to to that time period we started off talking about the the time period in the in the sixties seventies eighties with the uh, you know the Ellen White the Glacier View the your eighteen forty four reexamined um, one one of the faults that often I see arise is people are doing the ad hominem attack they're playing the player not the ball. And so that's another reason why often people don't get down into the well, what what's the actual topic here? What are they talking about? And um, I think it, it, I think as people watch this and as people watch other material on that time period, it's important to to look deep into what is the person saying instead of trying to just tear someone down and therefore invalidate what they're saying. Take a look at what they're saying and judge I, it on I, that basis. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether it's some spiritual point or moral, or ethical. Um, theological, scientific. I mean, let me give a simple illustration. Einstein says that E equals MC squared. Now, we know this is science. I'm not going to come to you and say, now look, you better believe this. And well, why, does, why do you believe that E equals MC squared? Well, you better believe it because, look, Einstein was such a remarkable man. In fact, he had visionary experiences. Uh, mm. He was virgin born. He, mm. was, he, he, he pre-existed, for goodness mm. sake. I mean, mm. this man was a man of authority. Now, if you accept it on the... You don't accept E equals MC squared... 
because someone says, Jesus said it, mm. God said it, someone had a vision and said mm. it. Mm. You have to look at the, mm. I like the that. formula, it's true. So mm. um, it comes back to what I said, the truth of what is said is only, in, it's only found in by examining what is said. Yeah, yeah. It's not uh, the, see the enlightenment, the human enlightenment, was based on those principles. And I believe in the, the great step forward of the human enlightenment. It was said in the Middle Ages that the theologians would argue uh, and the scientists would argue in those days, how many teeth had, how many teeth did a horse have, mm. according to Aristotle. No one would look in the horse's mouth to count the horse, the horse's teeth for themselves because that would be irreverent. You had to have an authority. Um, it was it's like the Pope with the sunspots. It, you know, it, you have to have some authority to say what, why this is the truth. And I mm. don't care whether you say now today what some people said. Well, my authority is the Bible says, you know. Well, is that a sufficient authority? Especially when you find, you know, uh, um, you got to, you got two creation stories in the book of Genesis, and one doesn't line up with the other one. And you got two nativity stories in the New Testament, one one by Luke and one by Matthew. And I don't care whether you stand on the edge; you can't rec reconcile one to the other. Mm. Um, so um, you you uh, in in the Enlightenment. The, the three main things that they reject or was the first one was argumentum ad hominem. You mustn't use that. That's not the way to go. The next one is argumentum ad populum. In other words, is it this is the consensus? Is this the popular view? Mm. Argue how many people believe it? Have any yeah. of the scribes and Pharisees believed? You know, as the New Testament says. And the third one is argumentum very condium. It's the argument according to authority. Mm. You you don't appeal to the the church says you don't. You have to quote some authority to say mm. argumentum very condium or condium. It's not an not a valid argument. Mm. It's no more valid than arguing argumentum ad hominem. Mm. Where you did those three come the, from? Uh, Where did those three come from? Well, there's about twelve of them. If you want, oh. uh, if you just look up, if you type into the typewriter, yeah, into the um, put it into the Google, <laughs> just uh, type up argumentum. Ad hominem, right. and they'll give you about, no, oh, I think there might be 10 of them, but the, yeah. I gave you the three main ones. Yeah. And another one was argumentum ad absurdum, and uh, it was, mm. and it goes on. These are all false arguments to establish, mm. establish a truth. Mm. So you can't argue a truth on the basis of an authority. Mm. Now, mm. you come to me and say to me, well, uh, well, why is that the truth? And you say to me, well, I'll tell you on the authority of Paul. Mm. Well, I'm a man in the enlightenment. I'm not going to accept that on the authority of Paul. Yeah. So You're going to accept or not accept it based on... What is being said. What is being said, <laughs> yeah. Now, Bob, we're going to have to leave it there for today. <laughs> Um, it's just about feeding time at the zoo here for me. Yes, um, me too. <laughs> I've got two. Uh, this is dogs. a long one. Jeez. It's another long one. I've loved it. I always love chatting with you. I really appreciate you taking the time. And I'm certainly hoping that I can get you back again once you come back from the Philippines, particularly once your website's up. We can kind of do a, uh, a chat about the website and bring up things people can explore and and fine, because I know a lot of people still have yeah, well, you know, I, respect you know, I, for what you do. I'd, uh, I'd, 
I'd rather be a writer than a, a speaker because I'm, I'm, uh, I think a bit better when I uh, analyse well, we, my... We, you know, we can do an interview on where people can find the writings <laughs> so, <laughs> when they're all collated. I, I, haven't, I haven't put up anything for, 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 for the last 20 years. I haven't done much, but I've done a lot of research and I... Mm. Uh, my brother John is still with me. Yeah. He's, he's turned 90 and he's very sharp minded, very sharp. I wonder if I, he'd come on for an interview. Uh, I wonder if no, he'd come I on. No, but he, he, um, he writes, he, he just writes a few notes and, and they're quite, he makes some good points, but all of us, statements when I gave you, I, I should write mm. an acknowledgement of the, yeah, of the contribution yeah. he's made and then, you know, reading these books and gathering out, you know, the different points mm -hmm. they make and putting it all together. Mm. Uh, it's nice that I've got someone to bounce it off. Here. Well, it's a wonderful document and let me know if, um, if and when that does become something that you could can finish off and, and we could share well, it with the, people. The document is part one. I've only mm. sent you part one and for goodness sake, that added up two more many pages. But I'm going on to part two. Part two is um, that I, I want to undertake. First of all, what the, I'll go through what the scholars are saying. Mm. Is, is the... It's something that concerns me a lot. It's the whole question of the question of violence. It's a very, uh, it's a troubling subject mm. because there's a lot of violence in the Old Testament, for instance. And um, some people complain about all the violence, the bloodshed mm. um, that's in the, in the Old Testament. But if you are a really honest, objective the final word that you have to say about what we have to deal with and out of the evidence of the new testament is that it's some respects it's like putting the old testament violence on steroids because At least the Old Testament didn't have a doctrine of eternal hell, mm. eternal punishment. Mm. There's a lot of it in the New Testament, a lot of it in the book of Matthew. Um, my biggest objection to the Christology, the Christ, is that he's a very, uh, he's a very violent imagery and very violent figure. And I... I have to deal with, I want to deal with the question of why did the Christian movement become such a violent movement? Mm. Mm. Do you know that the Christian religion, and this is admitted by Christian authors, of all the religions that have ever existed on the face of this planet, Christianity has shed more blood than any other religion mm. that's ever existed. And the Muslims will have to go a long way yet before they catch up wow. to equal what Christianity has done. Mm, mm. So why is that? Mm. Um, why did Christianity turn to Christology and Christology produce such a violent movement mm. that would kill you at the drop of a hat? That you story, that yeah, that story you mentioned earlier of Calvin and burning the guy alive for simply saying his thoughts on <laughs> he is the son. Well, what God. poor old Severus was trying to do is actually the, it's, he was part of the, what is called the Radical Reformation. Now, the Magisterial Reformation was the Reformation of Luther and Zwingli and Calvin and the major... <coughs> the major reformers, even in their own testimony, they never aspired to take the church back to the primitive 
apostolic era. Mm. They, they, Luther and, and the others, their vision was to take the church back to at least at, at basically to the time of Augustine. Right. They never had anything to do with the, the great creeds of the church or ever seek to examine any of them. Uh, but the radical reformers, uh, they were the characters like the Menno Simons and the Anabaptists and out of that grew and they, they, well, there were some fanatics among them too. They had troublemaker fanatics. And among them was brilliant men like Servetus was a, um, he was a physician and a theologian. He was a bit like a, he was like a, uh, a Schweitzer. He was a brilliant mm. man. And he was part of that radical, uh, he was trying to, he almost sort of rediscovered, he never quite got there. I don't think in those days they had the, they had the tools to get there. They had the information to get there. But he was trying to rediscover what really, he got pretty close to Jewish Christianity in some respects but they killed him for it. Mm. I mean, the heresies of Christianity were heresies that you get burned at the, yeah. at the stake for. And, uh, you know, you, you, uh, you, you're, you'd only have to breathe a, uh, a sort of some doubt about the Trinity and you, mm. you, you were mm. a goner. How do you spell his name? I'd want to research him a bit more. Um, S E V. Yep. S E V E T U S. S E V E R T U S. I think that's the way it's spelled. Yeah. Michael was his first name. Michael Servetus. If I, if you got him up there on the computer. Um, let's have a look. Um, Severitus, is it? I'll have to have a look. It's, I might have spelled something wrong then. I'll come back to that. I've at least made S a start. Oh, um, wait on. S-E-V, Severitus. S-E-R-B-E-T-U-S. Severitus. There we go. Yep. You got him. Yep, got him. Michael I'll, Stavetis. I'll enjoy looking that up later. Physician, physician, <laughs> and he got into theology. But what he, what he was, uh, I t just I mentioned one of the most, I'll mention this one to you. I'll see if I can get this book. I think your mic's gone. Oh, no, 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 you're still there. <laughs> this book is absolutely, a, this book is a, just a, a whiz of a book. I didn't put it up in my photograph. You see that there? Hold it up again. Uh, just a bit higher. Hold it up a bit higher. The Secret Legacy of Jesus. And who's it by? The, the author is a brilliant scholar. He's written another book on James. But this is... Um, what, this, what, what this book is about, he starts off on... Uh, the, uh, the, uh, Jewish Christianity and what Jewish Christianity stood for covers a lot of the points I've stood. Mm. He agreed. Uh, there's no argument about Jewish Christianity. What they, they all say the same, Catholic, Protestant, and so on. But he does a very good job of it. Then he goes on and shows their influence on Muhammad. Because the background of Muhammad, he was a, he's a, he's a family clan where a, a really a, they were, they were a sort of a sect of Ebionites or Jewish Christians. Yeah, they, that was his background. And uh, right. but then he goes on to show their, how they lived on in the Cathars of France and how the Pope slaughtered them. Yeah. And he ends up, believe it or not, uh, how the teachings of Christianity, their final expression in his book was the founding fathers of America. <laughs> wow. that, it's fascinating <laughs> stuff. Now, 
you recognise that the founding fathers were Washington. Mm. Um, was it Adams? Fr Franklin. Franklin. Fra Franklin, uh, what was his name? Um, Benjamin. Benjamin Franklin. Uh, George Washington. Uh, Thomas Jefferson. And so on. These were the, some of the major. And e even you can go down to the time of uh, uh, another ge generation later, Abraham Lincoln. Now, none of these men were Orthodox Christians. Mm. And he shows, I mean, Jefferson would say, well, it would be more tolerable to believe, more forgivable to believe in no God at all than to believe in the atrocious teachings mm. of the Christian theologians. <laughs> <laughs> he he like didn't it. want anything to do with a so-called Orthodox yeah. Christian theology. None I, of like, I like the uh, Jefferson Bible. Yeah, it's a great mm, Bible. Mm, I mean, yeah. it's a good start. The think that he did it without, you know, he's not a, an author, uh, an, uh, class as a biblical scholar, but he mm. shows that none, the, the, the fathers of the Christian church, I mean, the fathers of America weren't Christians mm. in an orthodox sense. No. None of them believed in orthodox Christianity, mm. the theology of the divinity of Jesus and all the Christology and Trinity and mm. and, 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 and and atonement, blood atonement. And they, did, they didn't believe in that. Mm. Uh, but they, they weren't atheists. They were believers. And he shows that actually what they, they, the elements of a lot of Jewish Christianity came right through to the, they never died out and they came right through to the fathers of America. And they mm -hmm. had this same vision of making a, America to be the light on the hill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Interesting vision. Uh, yeah. Fascinating stuff. <laughs> hey, uh, Adrian has posted this. Um, ask Bob to join SDA Q&A. So if you're on Facebook, come and join the Facebook group. And today we've been going live on YouTube as well as uh, over on Facebook in voice. Bob, I just want to thank you again so much for taking the time today to have this conversation. It's been most enjoyable. We've covered a lot of ground again. Oh, and, gee, uh, too much. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, know, never apologise. Where are you going to? No, don't <laughs> apologise. I, I wouldn't ask you onto the program if I, uh, if I didn't know that we were going to cover in-depth conversations on these topics. Just a quick uh, reminder to everyone, just lean forward, click the like button. If you're on YouTube, click the subscribe button. Those of you that are watching on Facebook would love you to um, go and join the YouTube channel, subscribe to it. And uh, if any of you have any loose change, send it over there to me, uh, uh, paypal.me, Peter Dixon Music, it really helps. I'm also offering a free song if you go to Peter Dixon Gumroad, you'll find it there, download it for free. And uh, yeah, once again, thank you so much to my uh, very special guest today, Bob Brinsmead. Uh, have a great time in the Philippines, Bob. Okay. And um, you're going to be working on your website, I understand. I'm going to try and... Um, yeah, I better... I want to get uh, all this stuff I've been... To, Talking about you know, mm. this historical research up on up, yeah. Uh, uh, um, tell and having it in having the, it in one place as well will be good. Uh, where the books are, and then mm. uh, you know, I the older I live, I I'm indebted to others. Uh, you 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 can't live without the the you know it's life that's human life. You know. It's mm. like, yeah. When I get on a jumbo jet and fly on a jumbo jet and I say, well, I think mine's like just the same as mine, you know, brains put a thing like this together. Amazing, Gee, you know, I didn't know I had this talent. And But how many how many people does it take to make a beautiful thing like that? you get on yeah. a jumbo jet? And, yeah. And, and how many minds and how many talents and, and the human contribution and... and you know, uh, one person can only do just a little tiny contribution. Yeah. I'm so indebted to so many thinkers and and just put out the evidence. They've spent some 
lifetime. Just yeah, I, I'm amazed that the man has spent a lifetime like James Robertson. Oh, I love his book on the gospel of Jesus. Yeah. Read James Robertson. Uh, he's one of the men of the Jesus Seminar, I suppose. But he spent his lifetime just studying the Q. Yeah. The, the, the sayings gospel Q, which was, he says, the real original. If you want to know what the really Jewish a documentation of what yeah. Jewish Christianity really believed, yeah. get back to the sayings gospel Q. That's, the, that's their contribution. Have you got that? Uh, just uh, James M. Robinson. Okay, oh. great. James uh, M. Robinson. Just to say, a man, this man, a great thinker, a beautiful, he seems a great spirit in which he writes this book. No ad hominem in it. He doesn't indulge in stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. No, just a beautiful spirit in which he writes. He spent a lifetime studying the sayings gospel cue, meaning the source of where Matthew and Luke got a lot of their material from. They got it from a Jewish Christian that was originally written up in Galilee, the Jewish Christians. Uh, and he tells you what uh, the, uh, the, what it, the, the witness was. Uh, Jesus, according to the earliest, yeah, but it's not called gospel. Uh, Jesus, according to the earliest witness, the earliest writers wasn't Matthew, Mark, Luke, the witness of Jesus. It wasn't Paul because mm. he never wrote a thing about the historical Jesus. Mm. The first witness of the historical Jesus was the sayings gospel Q written up in Galilee by the Jewish Christians. Mm. And, and he spent his lifetime just on that. Researching that. Uh, just researching that. Just, yeah. And, and we come along and we are indebted to that work he did. It's just amazing to, yeah. to have the benefit of that. Well, I'm going to be having a lot of fun researching uh, all this material. And uh, we'll leave it there for today. Thank you so much, yeah. Bob Brinsmead. I've really enjoyed it. And um, until next time, and thanks, everyone, for watching and staying with us. It's been wonderful. Yeah, hi, everybody. <laughs> we'll see you all next time. Okay.